Hi, and welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we take a look at the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Dan Larrabee. And I'm Luke DeWolf. This is episode nine and part three of our look at the Havamal, which is the sayings of the High One, or Odin in this case. And uh, yeah, how's it going, Luke? I'm good, Dan. How are you? Oh, pretty good. So, uh, of course, today we'll be using the Poetic Edda by, uh, translated by Jackson Crawford. And uh, we're using it with the permission of Hackett Publishing, which we're always uh, thankful for. Yep, thanks to those guys, definitely. And be sure to check out uh, his YouTube page, uh, Dr. Jackson Crawford. Uh, it's a great resource for uh, Old Norse uh language and mythology and that kind of stuff it's it's awesome definitely check it out we'll have a link uh, in our uh, description and a link to the uh, the poetic edit on amazon yeah please do follow along we've been getting a, a lot of good feedback that uh, this is something that uh, folks like to do just read along with us so yeah definitely check it out and pick up a copy if you're interested for sure so we're looking at the hava mall again today and uh, we're going to be starting on Verse 57, but just a bit of a recap before we uh, get into it. Uh, lessons that we've learned so far. Uh, don't, w- whenever you go traveling, you know, make sure you have the stuff that you need. Uh, don't go anywhere without weapons. Uh, look behind every corner because you don't know where enemies are. Uh, don't drink and be an idiot. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one. Uh, I don't know if we see any more of that in this bunch of stanzas today. Yeah, I think we're I think we're done that uh, that part. It does crop up every now and then, though, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, also, how to be a good friend and a proper host. And I guess that's sort of what we've covered so far. And today we'll be uh, looking at sort of how to get the best out of life, how to live a good life, and knowing how to attain wisdom, and not be sort of a I would say like an arrogant jerk about how much you know. I think that's a good summarization. So definitely check out the the previous episodes on the Havamal if you haven't already. Definitely would recommend it. This is sort of the the thing you, where you can dive in and just uh, you know pick up uh, Odin's nuggets of wisdom. But uh, I would recommend that you you check out the previous episodes first if you haven't already. Just uh, give them uh, a listen first, and then you'll be right right caught up with us as far as uh, the words of the High One. Yes. Although I do like uh, Odin's Nuggets of Wisdom. <laughs> like that could be like the title in parentheses, you know? Right, right. I like it. So I think without much further ado, we can dive right in. Yeah, let's do it. Just get to the verse here. And again, we're uh, starting on verse 57. A torch is lit by another and burns till it's burned out. A fire is kindled by another fire. A man becomes wise by speaking with other men, but foolish by keeping to himself. Luke, what does that mean? Well, Dan, I like this stanza a lot. Uh, To me, this is speaking to the transfer of knowledge from person to person. And and I mean, this is actually a... a, uh, a common metaphor is like sort of fire for, for spirit or the soul or something like that. I, that's, that's sort of one place that I, I went to with that. Um, isn't there another kind of metaphor in Christianity, something like don't hide your fire under a bushel or something like that. And, and yes. Yeah. So, so that, that's where I went as far as like kind of a, a similar metaphor. So fire as an example of something transferring, you know, the transfer of knowledge, lighting a candle with another candle, you know, it's, it's just a really good metaphor for talking to people. And we've already seen in previous episodes here where there's an emphasis on having humility and listening to the people that you're talking to. Uh, a, a rule from uh, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life is, uh, you know, assume that the person you're talking to might have something uh, that you don't know, something like that to to paraphrase there. So it's uh, definitely a big concept here. And it's, it's, you know, nice to know that uh, this is something that they recognized as well, just as far as, you know, you have to talk to people to get wiser and to accumulate more knowledge. So I think this is a milestone where it's the quickest we've ever mentioned Dr. Jordan Peterson. So that's like a fanboy level on its own, I think. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. It's awesome. Um, 
Yeah, it uh, it's funny when I was reading this, I didn't think of uh, the part about not uh, hiding your light, which I think is definitely in there. Um, I looked at it more as you know, if you if you want to have light or wisdom, you need to go and ask ask for it, and that's you're going to get it from learning from others. But I definitely uh, I definitely see and, and agree that if you have wisdom, then you should be sort of sharing it freely. Um, and it, it, it made me uh, think too, uh, just of Odin himself, how often he is uh, consulting with Mimir for knowledge or traveling to get more knowledge and even uh, learning all of, or a lot of his uh, magical stuff from Freya. So having to, you know, he, even though he is the all father and, you know, ostensibly all knowing all that kind of stuff. It's, it's only because he understood that to get more wisdom, he had to go and, and seek it out. He, th this is sort of the, don't be an arrogant jerk. If you think you know stuff, it's he, he was humble enough to know that, no, I need to go out and ask and search for knowledge. So it's a great, uh, it's a great verse. I really like it. It's, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in it actually. I agree, and, and you know what's what's interesting is that humility seems to be the thread that we've we've found throughout the Havamal in general, and and that's something that you know honestly I had never really heard as that being kind of a, an emphasized virtue to take out of the the Havamal. Humility was never kind of one of those those things, and uh, but it's it's really been interesting that that seems to be a key feature where it's it's like if you are humble and you listen to the people around you and and you don't um, think too much of yourself, think arrogantly and whatnot, then you are going to grow in knowledge, grow in status because people will think more of you for having taken the time to listen and to learn. And yeah, it's, it's just a, a really big deal. And I think that's uh, definitely referenced here for sure. For sure. And we'll definitely see more humility as, as it goes along. But yeah, it really does seem like humility is one of the linchpins in, in the Havamal and I guess ultimately to how to live a, a good and honorable life. And it's funny because you wouldn't, you know, when we think of Vikings, we don't think of humility. Like that's probably one of the last things you would think of. But apparently it was uh, something that was sort of deeply ingrained in their ethos as a society. So Exactly. Really like that a lot. Uh, maybe just another quick note about fire symbolism. We we have touched on it a fair bit before, where fire seems to be a a symbol of first of all creation and destruction. So it, this falls under the the banner of general chaos, which you know creation and destruction kind of are, are subsets of that symbolic concept. But there's definitely the idea of fire as being, you know, life giving, which is mentioned, I think, mostly in our first episode of the Havamal, where we where we talk about how hospitality is is given. And, and you know, if you're out from the cold, you need to come in to a fire, which, you know, it's, it's a, the idea that humanity discovered fire. And that was a big, big leap. And, you know, even today, we need to heat our homes somehow. And it's it's through fire. That's that's essentially how it's done. You know, we're burning natural gas instead of uh, wood, but it's the same concept. That's how we're heating our homes and that's how we're staying alive, right? So that's that's definitely something there. But fire is also kind of this destructive force as well. And we see that in, in Ragnarok, Valuspa, part three, fire engulfing the earth, right? It's, it's uh, definitely that capability for both creation and destruction. And that's Ultimately, that's what fire symbolizes here, I think. And it's, it's, I like the, the nuance that it's, it's akin to fire because knowledge has that capability too. It has that, that capacity to be creative and to be something that is good and, and generative on the world. But, you know, knowledge and passing knowledge around can also be destructive in, in both a positive and a negative way. It can tear down the things that, uh, you know, are bad about the world, sort of like a, a forest fire where everything grows back well later, or it can be used actually destructively. Like the words that you use and you say can be used as a weapon and can be used to tear people down. So I think it's, it's just a nice uh, little nuance that fire is used here as that symbol of transferring knowledge, because it does have that capability to create and to destroy.
Definitely. And I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking about how often when you, when you learn something new, sort of the, the old you dies or, you know, if we're going to use the, the fire analogy, sort of is burned away. And often depending on that knowledge, it can be quite painful, but it, it's, it does encompass that destruction and creation um, within oneself when learning new knowledge. So it, it's, it's actually quite a uh, quite an analogy they've uh, created here. Yeah, nice and dense. And I do want to touch on the last line as well, like a foolish man keeps to himself, something like that. So that's almost the flip side. That's, you know, you not going out into the unknown and, and talking to people as well. And I think the best analogy for that these days is the social media echo chambers that people get themselves into. You know, you only surround yourself with people who share the same viewpoint and then you don't hear anything. It becomes a vicious cycle. Facebook only recommends to you, you know, stories that you've already liked essentially, or the same sort of viewpoints that you've already liked and you don't get any exposure to the other side of the argument. And I think that's, it's almost a warning. Like this is a big pattern and a big problem in the world right now is these social media echo chambers. And and I don't think anyone would, would say that it's, it's not a negative that, that, the things that you are consuming and and reading and listening to are really just the things that you've already liked before because you're only getting recommendations for things that you you already enjoy right if i think it's it's something it's a an interesting social critique that no matter what the medium is you know going back all the way to where it was only you know, talking to other people directly, but now where it's like we're connected through the internet, but you can still get yourself into this sort of silo here. I think that's, it's a, it's a warning against doing that and a call to get yourself out there, get yourself out of your little bubble and uh, maybe consume some media from the opposite side of the political spectrum, or maybe try and hear the viewpoint of the opposite side of the argument in, in a, in a genuine upfront manner that is in good faith, you know, not trying to tear the other side down. So for sure. I I've seen, uh, I think they call them like scatter graphs or scatter charts where, you know, on specifically on Twitter where, you know, they'll have the, the right wing and the left wing and the, the tweets and it'll be, they'll show there's like no, inter, there's virtually no interaction between the two. It's just all in their own echo chambers. And I don't think it's, you can treat it as a, a microcosm for life, but it's not a good one because you know, most of your friends, like close friends, even you're going to have differing viewpoints on however many things just because you're different people, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect the friendship at all. And I, I think it prevents you from sort of making up, you know, the other person on the other side of the argument and, and, you know, just giving them all the terrible qualities in the world and then, and then treating them treating everyone as if that's, that's who it is. When in reality, most people are pretty uh, nuanced in what they believe. And honestly, you can usually get along with most people, even if it, you might not be become best friends, but you can live peacefully and maybe even have fun with them. So there's, it's a, it's a weird thing going on, at least in social media, but, and it, and also in some ways, like social media is keeping to yourself. Sure. You're putting it out there, but you're not actually interacting with others. It's, it's you doing it. So, um, yeah, that, that's a great, uh, a great observation for that final line that it really, really lets you know that on oh, what's that, that famous home, no man is an Island. Right. Right. No, th- this is, uh, the, the, the stanza as a whole is, is, fascinating and and really distills the the idea that you you should just be out there talking to people and and learning and and trying to learn in good faith as well because i mean i I think that's a a whole big point too where it's like if if all you're out to do is is browbeat people into agreeing with you like what are you going to learn you know it's uh, i yeah i really like this stanza we've we've said that a lot but no for real this is this is great as a strong one to start off with agreed Shall we uh, move on? I'm good to go. Sounds good. I'll be uh, reading uh, stanzas 58 and 59. Back to the poem. Rise early if you want to take another man's property or his life. A sleeping wolf seldom wins a sheep or a sleeping warrior a victory. 
Rise early if you have no one to work for you, and get straight to work. You lose more than time if you sleep when it dawns. For the early riser, wealth is half won. The early riser, huh? Yes. What do you think uh, this is saying? I think this is something like, get after it. Get after it. That's a quote from Jocko Willink. Uh, huge, huge fan of Jocko Willink's work. And I think basically everything he says is is that uh, there's something touching on everything, every little main thing he says in these two stanzas here. So get after it. You know, get up early. Get to what you're doing. Get to work. You know, that's that's huge, right? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. It is. It's and and why would you wait if you if you wanted to go get something? Why would you wait to get it? You get up early, get after it. There's there's really no other way to to put it other than this simply is get after it. That may or may not have been the only notes I have for for these two stanzas. <laughs> I've got maybe a couple of little little extras, but uh, that was that was about it. And you know, Jocko is the kind of guy. He's an ex Navy SEAL, and I mean, he did some like amazing things in the war in Iraq. Uh, led task unit Bruiser in the Battle of Ramadi, and I mean, that was one of the most highly decorated units in uh, in uh, well, the whole war. I think was the the case there, and uh, got some great books out on uh, on leadership and uh, just how to live your life. Uh, it, it's uh, he's a great guy. Definitely would recommend uh, checking him out. We'll link to his uh, his channel below his YouTube channel. He's got a popular podcast as well, the Jocko Podcast. But uh, you know, one thing that he does is, I believe it's essentially every morning he takes a picture of his watch, like his Timex watch, and it's got the time on it. And this is when he's getting up and getting after it, going and and having a workout. That's one of his big things. Is that you know, a good way to start the day is to go and have a workout. And I mean, it just starts your day off right and sets you up for success. Another big thing that he says, another one of his uh, catchphrases or sayings is discipline equals freedom. And uh, essentially what that's saying is, you know, if you schedule your day right or you, you know, take the time to discipline your day and all that, it actually, you'll get more free time out of it at the end of the day. And I think this is saying something similar. It's like, you know, you, you get to work and you get the things you want done accomplished. And then maybe you actually have some time to enjoy life, which is, uh, definitely another big concept that, uh, we've talked about here in the Havam all already. So definitely, I, I mean, the sleeping warrior, isn't victorious. I mean, what's better than victory? So if you want, if you want to win and actually, uh, Jocko talks about this too, is that the first win of the day is dragging yourself out of bed at four 30 when you're, you're still a little tired and bed is warm and all that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, I know I've been guilty of, uh, you know, my alarm goes off and then I'm like, ah, I can, I can just sleep for another hour. I'll, I'll work out later or another day or something like that. And it's like, I have definitely been guilty of it. It's, it's hard to do. It's hard life to, to live if you commit to doing that. But I, uh, I downloaded his album of like inspirational things. And one of his alarms to get up is just him going, get up and get up now. And it's like, oh my God. <laughs> but you know, if you want to, take another man's property or, or his life, you need to get up before him. Exactly. It, it's it, definitely when getting to this particular stands, I was like, Oh, I know exactly what we're, what <laughs> we're going to discuss here, what we're going to talk about. But no, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's huge though. It's, it's, it's something that you, you may not enjoy doing, but it, it really is what it's something to set you up for success. It's, it's an actionable thing that can set you up for a success. If you start getting up early consistently and getting things done while the rest of the world is asleep, I mean, you're just going to be in so much better shape. And I mean, definitely it translates to maybe you go to bed a little bit earlier or something like that because you want your sleep or something like that. Although I, I think in Jocko's case, he, he just only gets like four hours of sleep a night or six hours or something like that. Yeah. He's one of those weird, weird uh, guys who can do that. I know, uh, he had, uh, Tim Ferriss of the four hour work week fame on his podcast. And, you know, Tim Ferriss is pretty successful himself. And he was like, yeah, no, I couldn't do that. I, I'm an eight hour a night guy. <laughs> and there was just a, a guest on the Joe Rogan experience where it was like, uh, a sleep specialist or something. And, and, uh, I didn't watch it all the way through, but the, the cliff notes of it was something like, 
if you're not getting eight hours of sleep a night, you're, you're like, you're not living properly or something like that. But, you know, then there's the exception to the rule, I suppose, because uh, I don't think anyone would, uh, would say Jocko's not a successful guy. No, I, I actually do think there are like genetics come into play at some point, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's just funny to <laughs> either way though, like going to bed early is not a, not a bad thing. In fact, uh, I think it was last episode where they said that, you know, no one will make fun of a man who goes to bed early. Right, exactly. So, I mean, that's, that's the whole idea. I think it's the, the two sides to it. Go, like go to bed early and then get up early the next day and actually get things done because you, you know, I mean, that, that's the whole point. You don't want to get up early and then just lounge around, right? Like that's not going to set you up for success. This is definitely saying, you know, get things done, like do the things you need to do. Like I, I actually really like the, uh, um, if you have a few workers or something like that, like that's, I think that's almost saying something like you, you can only really rely on yourself to get things done. And so just get up early and go do it. Like, I think it's pretty clear. Right. And in this, sure. this two couple of stanzas, right. So definitely shall we move on? Yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's move on. But let's get after the rest of the hall them all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and be, be disciplined and all that. Ah, it's so good. All right. Stanza number 60, back to the poem. You should know how to dry logs for firewood and bark for roofing. And also this, how to measure time and seasons. So I'll just uh, point to, in the Larrington translation, she takes the last couple of stanzas in a different direction. So Crawford says how to measure the time and seasons. And that's, first of all, hugely important. We've talked about this before, the the advent of the discovery of time. That's a big concept. And first of all, just our, in, in the Boluspa, where they essentially describe how time was discovered, the, the idea of time and, and the ordering of time. And that is hugely important hugely important for human development as well, where it, it turns into like the discovery of the future and the idea of um, sacrifice that all stems from the idea of time. But in the Larrington translation, she actually says something like you should know how much wood you need to get you through a quarter year or half of a year. So the distinction, I think, it's it's subtle and it's getting at the same point. You should know how to tell time and the seasons. That's that's definitely something there. But I think it's also a case of you should know what you need to set aside for that period of time in order to not die. So, but but I think it's I think it's a big uh, a big distinction here, right? Like it's it's um, it's an important nuance that turns it from simply knowing the time and the seasons. And I, and I have a whole thing here about kind of the relation to the first part of the stanza and the second part, but I think it flips it to an emphasis on actually the idea of sacrifice, the idea of storing things away for, for the future, which is something that I really, that that's what enabled humanity to, to grow. It was setting some things aside for the future and lets you survive famine and starvation and then all these other things. If you, sacrifice for the future and that would have been acted out through ritual dramas of actually enacting a sacrifice as well and that's how lots of the concepts of sacrifice took place so for sure i like it because it uh, very plainly is saying like if you take a sort of a step back from it is don't be useless make sure that you have the things that you need done done and know how to do it properly and it's it's sort of the most basic stuff like make sure you have wood for a fire uh make sure you know how to put a roof on your house it's it's just shelter there's a a great uh book that uh, my wife and i got for my father-in-law a few years ago for christmas and it was something called, i think it's called like norwegian wood and it's all about uh like chopping and stacking and using wood in the Scandinavian way. And there's at the end, it, like the conclusion of the book is like uh, a husband and a father can be excused for not being able to afford a trip to Disneyland or for forgetting his uh, wedding anniversary with his wife. But a man that runs out of wood in the middle of winter and lets his family freeze is worth nothing. And it, like, it was hardcore. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly it. And so when I read that, it, you can you can actually see that this sentiment is still like very present in in Scandinavian culture and basically anywhere that 
you actually have to work a little bit to uh, survive the environment. That's really cool. I know you've mentioned that that book to me before as, as you know, just something interesting. It's a great book. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. But no, no I, I see exactly how you're tying that in, in here. And, and, and like I, I went in a, in a similar direction here. Like you just need to know how to do the basic things. Exactly. Right? The basic things to be able to survive. Like, and, 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 I, and I mean, <laughs> that's such a good point. You, you, you should have enough to last you through the winter. I mean, that's, that's something to do with what some combination of preparedness and whatnot, but also just being able to have the concept of putting enough away for the future that it's right. Oh, for sure. Exactly. And, and knowing, knowing something about the time and the seasons and all that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, it's and because if you're useless in these things, like, you're going to die or your family will, will die. And I would actually say like your family dying because of your dumbness is way worse. Definitely. And, and, you know, if you, if you don't know how to do these things, you're dependent on somebody else to be able to do these things for you. I think that's also the, the side of it here and, and not being competent in it, the very minimum, those things that you need to ensure that you have enough to live on or, you know, in a worst case scenario that, that you can survive, like that's, that's something you need to know or else, you know, you're dependent on others in order to be able to survive. So, and, and dependent on others, not in a, well, I guess the, these skills that they're talking about specifically are pretty basic. Um, but there's also an idea of, you know, you might be good at one skill and your neighbor might be good at another skill and you would trade them. And so you're kind of, interdependent on each other not and certainly not codependent but interdependent in that you're working together and you both have your realms of expertise but this is very much saying like if you can't just if you can't do at least this like what good are you so definitely yeah another another good one here shall we uh, move on to the next stanza let's do it all right stanza 61 you should always go out with your hair combed and a meal in your belly, even if you can't afford good clothes. You should not be ashamed of your shoes and pants, nor of your horse, even if it's not a good one. So I'll bring in another point from Larrington on this one. The nuance that she gets to is that washed and fed, a man should ride to the assembly. So we've already talked about the assembly or the thing in previous episodes where this was the, the gathering of all the, all the men who were allowed to have a vote in the community and they would get together and they would discuss issues. And, and this, this really turned into the concept of a parliament as essentially, except we're, we're not direct democracy or representative democracy now essentially is the only difference. But, uh, I, I think that, nuance again is it turns it into you know you, you should do what you can to make yourself presentable just for a sake of you know taking pride in in yourself and, and your appearance and and your position in society when you go out into the world when you go and present yourself to the assembly of peers but then those things that you aren't able to do yet those things that you you haven't achieved don't dwell on that I think that is the the whole the stanza as a whole is something like do what you can to make yourself presentable but those those things that you can't afford you know the, the the nice clothes or something like that don't don't worry about that definitely it it seems to be more of a it actually seems to be more of an attitude than like act, the actual material items so you know they're going out going out into the world and they obviously take pride in their in their existence and you know they're they're showing a certain level of respect for what they're going out to and and because they're they're doing that a certain amount of respect is then returned to them and and should be like i i think if someone had you know saw someone who uh maybe didn't have the best clothes but was obviously put together and was showing respect if they were to be there to make fun of this person it would bring dishonor on them rather than the the target of their ridicule i agree because i think the idea is something like you, you should just you should show up to society as best you can but emphasis on 
as best you can. You know what I mean? Like get yourself into a presentable state. Like they say specifically comb your hair or, or wash yourself and, and eat a meal because that is so that you're not dependent on the rest of society, right? You're doing what you can to make yourself presentable and uh, what functional in said society. But then, you know, those, those things that you, you can't control, like don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's uh don't like, don't be ashamed if you can't afford the best yet. You're still showing up to society and participating and you're doing what you can to show society that respect. Yeah. I like that. Definitely. It, I, and I really, I really like it because it, it, uh, and I mean, you can see this just in your day to day where people that people that you respect, do you even notice what they're wearing? Really? Like I, I don't because it's, it's not, uh, it's not important. Now it, and you don't notice them because they're not, they're not so, I guess, shabbily dressed as they might have said in the olden days that you notice it, right? They obviously, you know, care about who they are and what they're putting out. So it just, it kind of demands a level of respect that you're just quite willing to give. So it, it, it just really shows you know, take pride in, in who you are almost for the mere fact that you are, you are living and existing in the society and you're doing your best to contribute. Exactly. Doing your best. That like, I think that's, that's it, right? Like this is almost, if you take in the flip side, this is like, if, if you see that someone is genuinely doing their best and, but it's, it's not up to some whatever lofty standard or whatever, it's still like they're doing the best they can. And, you know, you should get credit for that. And, and, you know, someone who's on that trajectory is, is likely going upward, right? Like if you take the time to comb your hair or shave or, or whatever, or, or like, if, you know, for, for a woman, like, you know, make your hair nice or something like that. That's just, you know, you, you are at least taking enough pride in your appearance that it's like, okay, you're, you're probably on an upward trajectory. Like if you have someone who just lets, like doesn't wash their hair and doesn't really care about that when they're going outside, like they're not on the path to success themselves, I don't think, right? No, for sure. Because they're not, well, in a lot of ways, they're not taking care of one of the few things that they can actually control in their life. And I think that's sort of what it is, is that they're, you know, in the stanza, you're doing the best you can to mitigate the the inherent chaos in life that you can actually control. I mean, there's so much that we can control, but how how you yourself present yourself to the world, that's something that you do have control over. So Right. I, I really do think it is is something like that. Like don't don't dwell on what you can't control because and we and we've seen this before as well. Like don't go to bed thinking about the things that you yet to do or something like that because it's just gonna just going to stress you out. Right. And I mean, I think this is the same thing. Like, don't, don't worry about what you can't control, but what you can control, do the minimum effort within that to, to be presentable to society and then go out into society. Like what, what did we start with? Like just go into the world and talk to people like this is the same, in the same vein, right? Definitely. Shall we uh, move on? Let's do it. Stanza 62. A hungry eagle snaps his beak and stretches out his neck when the sea comes into sight. People get the same look about them when they walk among strangers and have no one to speak well of them. So this one was interesting. This was this was one of the first where I really went, huh, I don't have the foggiest idea what this is saying. But then... The, the second part of the stanza is almost what unlocks the the first part to me. You know, people get a look about them when they're among strangers, no one to speak well of them, which to me almost is sort of like having a guide to an unfamiliar area or something like that. It, I think it's talking about being in unfamiliar territory, being in the unknown. And I mean, for all the emphasis on going and actually being in the unknown, like they've, they've talked to... Uh, we've talked about previously, you know, like go out into society, go out and talk to people. You know, I think it's, this is still recognizing that that is still scary. It's still like, it really should be. It's, it's still scary to be in the unknown somewhere unfamiliar without a guide or without someone to speak well for you. And then bringing this back just sort of to the, to the first part of the stanza here, uh, the, the idea of the Eagle, Larrington made a note 
in her translation where there's some debate as to whether this is a sea eagle going out to to hunt like a like an eagle that is naturally at home uh, on the ocean and go hunting for fish there or a land eagle an eagle based on the land where it's actually disoriented because it's gone to the sea and if you remember the ideas and the the symbolization of the sea it's the unknown the pre cosmic pre-cosmogonic chaos that has the potential for creation but also the the potential for destruction to kill you and it's it's a symbol of that um that potential almost and the unknown in general so to me this is the stanza as a whole points to it being like a metaphor for going out into the unknown and then you're disoriented right and you're not necessarily somewhere familiar and you don't have someone to guide you through and I think it's sort of recognizing that that's, that's scary, but taken with other stanzas, it's like, you still got to go do it though. Definitely. I, uh, sort of building on that, I, I looked at it from a pretty close, uh, a pretty close read to it. So the first thing I thought of, uh, when I was looking at reading about the hungry eagle uh, snapping his beak and stretching out his neck when the sea comes into sight, um, it's kind of like being hangry. So that, that's what do they call it? A portmanteau of hunger and angry. But that's sort of uh, some. I know I get this way. It's sort of jittery, paranoid, and uh, just grumpy with everyone if I'm too hungry. And because what, when I was thinking, like walking among strangers. And no one to speak well, and you kind of get, uh, you kind of do get defensive if you're really hungry, and because you're, because you're hungry, and it's a, uh, it's one I think the primary biological drive. So there's a, uh, it's it's very powerful, obviously. Some other interesting things about the stanza. I I was reading somewhere, and I, I can't remember it off the top of my head, unfortunately, but that it this also might refer to. Uh, someone who's who's at uh, the thing, as we were talking about earlier, and uh, giving or giving or looking for testimony, and if charges have been brought up against them, having their friends speak up in their favor is like that. That was kind of a big form of evidence and would weigh heavily in the court, so that you might your side might win. But uh, as it's saying here you know, people would get this, sort of the same look as this hungry eagle or this disoriented eagle um, when they don't have someone to speak for them in in the thing. And it just made me think of, we, we've seen it in movies where, you know, people are charged with something and no one will speak up for them and they get really like angry and start shouting at people and that kind of stuff. And that was sort of the, the image I had when I was reading this that, you know, if you don't have anyone by your side, it's going to be, you're, you're quite alone. And especially in this society where it's, it is tribal and it's very close knit and it has to be so that everyone can survive or at least have the best chance of surviving. Uh, not having anyone at your back is a, it's a big deal and it, it'd be quite disheartening. Like it would, it would kind of gut you. So that was sort of uh, that's, that's where I uh, took the stanza. And I, I think it really sort of dovet- dovetails nicely with what you were uh, talking about. Yeah, it's interesting. We went in in some kind of different directions, but it, it kind of all tied into the same thing. And, and I think it, it also points to this is kind of a some relatively obscure symbolism and definitely a metaphor that uh, is a little bit harder to cut through. But, you know, we, we both got somewhere, right? And so For that's sure. something, right? Definitely. I think, I think this is something that Back then, it, w- it would have been totally understood, but in the modern world, it's sort of we're kind of we're kind of guessing at the the everyday knowledge that is contained in here. Which it, it's kind of like it's one of the fun things for me is like what what would what is this something that they would just would have understood automatically because it's sort of common parlance. So yeah, yeah, no, it's but I do think we sort of got to the. Uh, the core of it that you you need to have that 
you need you need to take care of yourself, be part of the society, and and go out prepared because if you if you're not, you'll be disoriented, you'll be among strangers, and that's not a good place to be. Definitely, totally agree. Awesome. Shall we move on? Let's do it. Stanza sixty three. If you want to be called wise, you should know how to ask and answer wisely. Tell your secret to one person, never to two. Everyone knows if three people know. Yeah, another uh, another good one. I think this is almost uh, how to have meaningful conversations, you know, like knowing how to ask and answer. First of all, saying that you should know how to ask, like, then, well, that's huge, right? If, if you're asking questions of someone in a, in a genuine manner, you know, presumably you want to know something, right? You want to find out if that, if the person next to you has something for you to learn. I mean, that was essentially what Odin was doing when he, he went to the Hall of Vathusnir, when he was, you know, going to go ask him questions about all, all this wisdom. I think, Having a stanza like this almost points to how that whole story was Odin going and seeing if there was something he, he could learn there, right? It wasn't just Odin going and and trying to appear the wisest or whatnot. I mean, at the end of the day, he was, but, you know, that that doesn't mean you shouldn't ask questions and see if there's something that the person you're talking to might know more than you about, right? Absolutely. I like the part, too, about... Uh, telling your secrets to one person, never to two. Uh, because I, I just think that's such a great illustration of human nature because what's better than a secret. It's the, the power that you have is awesome. And then, and it's, if you share with one person, then you can kind of share that power with that person. But the more people you tell, the less power it has. And then soon everyone knows. And it, and I think three is pretty much right on at the point, like, (laughs) <laughs> that critical mass of people knowing your secret before it gets out. So it, it's a very, uh, oh, I can't think of the word, but it's just a very astute uh, observation on human nature. Well, and you know, I, I think it, it dovetails perfectly with uh, that first stanza today, 57, where it's like fire is the metaphor for knowledge being transferred. I mean, you know, it's something getting out of control, right? It's just going to keep on going and going and going. Absolutely. That is a great uh, connection. It's the, the, the stands as a whole. I mean, it, a lot of these are really talking about how, you, you know, if, if you know how to listen and ask questions, maybe you can get to the point of, you know, you're actually the person who can answer as well, because it doesn't just say ask, it says ask and answer. And I think this is saying the ideal situation is two people having a conversation where they both are looking to know more because, you know, they, they have mutual respect for each other and are trying to find out if the other person has, has more knowledge. And, and I mean, that's nothing but a mutually beneficial exchange at the end of the day. If both people walk out knowing more than they did at the start. I mean, that's how knowledge develops and builds, right? So Definitely. And I also see in, in the asking and answering wisely that it kind of kind of a call to know your audience. So I think we've all been in that situation where we've we've said something that may have that, and because we didn't know the uh, the people that we were talking to, we kind of put our foot in our mouth without even knowing it. And uh, I think if you if you're wise about how you ask and answer, you can kind of keep your foot out of your mouth while talking to people, and then start figuring out sort of where they, uh, where the beliefs lie and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's also something like, uh, you, you should only answer a question if you definitely know the answer or if you, if you don't know the answer, be clear that, you know, that I think this is the case or I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here, but this would make sense, you know, because that's still good. That's still, you know, not only yourself trying to figure something out, but it could be helpful to the conversation. Right. But the the nuance of asking and answering wisely, I think to me just sort of says like answer when you know you're correct, right? And definitely, ju- and just the same thing as knowing your audience as well. It's like also only answer when it's like here you're not going to get uh, uh, killed for having this opinion or something like that, right? For sure, killed metaphorically is uh, <laughs> yeah. what, what I meant. So 
And I, I think this is also a good place to remind uh, you, our lovely listener and viewer, that we are not experts in this and that uh, we're just learning as we go as well. So feel free to correct us whenever we uh, mess up. Absolutely. We always need to have that caveat in there. Definitely. <laughs> that way we don't get killed in the comments, right? That, yeah, yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, shall I move on? Let's go. Stanza 64. Back to the poem. A wise man should use his abilities only in moderation. Otherwise, when he is in battle, he'll learn that no one is bravest of all. So this one was interesting to me. So in a lot of ways, if, if you try and be good or great at, at something, for, first of all, you, you know, if you're trying to get to the top of whatever game you're playing, be the best you can possibly be, the, the nuance or connotation there is, is that you, you should be operating at your best when it counts. But then I, I guess what this is saying is something like you should in general only be doing something kind of at a moderate level. And, th and this to me comes, it reminds me of the idea that you don't want to always be training at your maximum all the time. You want to be somewhere a little bit below your maximum. So you get better and better and better and things really become effortless. The skill, whatever it is that you're trying to do, you know, if you're pushing yourself all the time, if you are pushing yourself to the very maximum you can all the time and you're, you know, you're never progressing something like that, you're not, um, you're not in an ideal situation. It, you, it would be more ideal if you were operating at 70% capacity and you're still doing quite well, but then maybe you have some room to grow or some gas in the tank to really kick it into overdrive if you, if you need it. And that I think there's, um, there's a saying, um, I forget exactly where I heard this, but it's, it's, uh, it's about baseball and it's something like if you, if a baseball scout saw two players and one could run from home plate to first base in say X amount of time, but given a hundred percent of his effort, and then there was another one who could run in the same amount of time at 90% of his effort which one would you take? And the answer is you take the one who's at 90% of his effort because you can still push him to that extra place, 10%, something like that. That, that That's rough. That's a paraphrase. But the, and I, again, I, I forget where I heard it, but it's, uh, that's what it reminded me of. That's great. I, I had a, like, this one was kind of a tricky one because we've been, we've been hearing a lot about, you know, make sure that your competent skills and, you know, doing your best and all that kind of stuff. And then here it says, you know, only use, only use your abilities in, in moderation. Uh, and sort of what I came up with was, uh, I, I was wondering if it was sort of a, a call to not be a show off and not be a, not be an arrogant jerk about how great you are. And well, if, there's a few reasons. One, it, it annoys people to no end. And it makes them, it makes people more reluctant to help you. And they actually, they actually want to see you fall and get taken down a few notches so that you learn humility, which, and which is where I think we get the, uh, the part where it says, uh, in battle, he'll learn that no one is bravest of all. I think it, uh, I think people are less likely to help you if you get into trouble. Like, for example, in battle, if you've been just a, a raging jerk the whole time about how awesome you are. It, uh, it reminds me sometimes in football, you don't really see this in the NFL, but in uh, lower levels, like high school, like if the quarterback was a big jerk and just, you know, acting as if he was better than everyone, the, uh, the lineman would just stand up during the play and let people run by and tackle him. And that sort of, th this is what I was thinking of when I was reading this, that, they're just going to let you get walloped because they hate you because you're such a jerk. <laughs> if you're, if you're always uh, showing off on the other hand, they could also think that you can just, you could do it all on your own and not help, which is also terrible as well. So interesting. Yeah. I like that you took it to the interplay with, with other people. Yeah. I, I was, uh, I think I went a little more like on the level of as an individual for sure. And you took it to, kind of as society as a whole. So great. Another case of uh, complimenting each other Absolutely. well, I think here. So, but uh, no, and I, and I think um, end of the day, it, it kind of all ties together to 
point to like you shouldn't always be always giving it a hundred percent. Like there's a difference between putting in like your full effort sort of thing, but also like performing at a hundred percent. Like it's something like, um, I think if you're doing that, it's going to be obvious if you're outmatched. Like if you're always giving it a hundred percent and then someone else is doing better than you, you're not going to have any more to give. You know what I mean? And, and then I mean like qualifying races in the Olympics for the hundred meters, for example, no one sets the world record in the qualifying race. It's always in like the, the final, something like that. Like there are times for you to go all out and to go a hundred percent and, and run your fastest or do your absolute best. But I think that's, you know, when it's time to perform, when it's time to actually execute, when there's something on the line versus prior to that, it's like do well enough, but you know, don't push yourself to the maximum because I think, I think there's something to like, if you're always pushing yourself to your maximum, it's actually going to be worse off for you because you're, you're not going to recover from that and you're not going to be able to grow effectively. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I really agree with that. Shall I move on? Let's go. We've got uh, just a short stanza coming up, but a good one. Uh, stanza 65. You will often get repayment in kind for the words you speak to others. Larrington made the note here that this is this is obviously missing half of it, essentially. So, okay, that's too bad. But I think we can definitely go on uh, on something here. Uh, like, I mean, what is this other than like the idea that you're going to get what you deserve for what you put out into the world? Like almost something like karma. Like if you are if you are saying good things to people, if if you are doing the things that are going to make you well liked and then, then other people are going to pay that right back. But if you're tearing people down, people will eventually tear you down. Something like that. Definitely. We, I, we have so many sayings that cover exactly this, even in our own culture, like what goes around comes around. When we talk about karma, this is, this is what we're talking about, even though it's in a technical sense, it's not a great, uh, it's not, it, it kind of gets to the idea of karma, but it's not actually what karma is in Hinduism or Buddhism or something like that. Yeah, it's a bit different. It's a little bit different. But it is a, this idea, or in uh, like new age circles, like uh, motivational speakers, it's, you know, you get what you put out to the universe, that kind of thing. It's all, it's all wrapped up into this. And I do like that they, they there's a caveat of you will often, because in bad things still happen to good people and all that kind of stuff and good things happen to bad people. But in general, what you're putting out into the world is what you're going to get back. And it, it shows that, and Dr. Peterson talks about this too, is that you don't get away with anything, right? So if you're not going to get away with anything, if everything is going to come to collect at some point, you know, you better make sure that, it's an easy collection that you're putting out good things so that it's not, uh, you know, you're not surprised by it one day and it just, uh, you know, wallops you out of nowhere. Agreed. It, it's, uh, I, I like your, your point about it's, you know, it's, it's only often, right. It, certainly the world is not fair and you're not always going to get repaid exactly in kind, but it's kind of a, an on average sort of deal. And it's, it's definitely, um, I think the, the call is like, generally put out into the world good things not not to be wishy-washy or, or anything about that but like you, you know live your life in an upstanding way and g generally try and uh do your best for other people be your best for other people and you know they'll pay that back uh, another idea was something like if you always uh, split the rewards with your friend of of some endeavor if you split it 50 50 you know that's great everyone is is getting exactly what they need there. But if you always split it 60, 40 so that your friend gets the 60, you're going to get invited to many more games and you're going to get many more rewards over the course of time. And then the flip side is if you insist on being selfish and you're like, Oh, Hey, well, no, I think I did more of the effort there. I should get, I should get a little bit more out of this while well, you're not going to get invited to many games, even if you were the one contributing more, right? Something like that. For sure. Yeah. There's lots of, uh, great examples that you can go into with this because it, it's such a universal idea that, you know, they were talking about hundreds of years ago and we're still talking about it today. It's, it's one of those, uh, 
dare I say truths, with like a capital T. Well, there we go. <laughs> Shall we move on? Let's do it. Verse 66. Back to the poem. I have come too early to some events and too late to others. The drinks were all gone or else not even made. A hated man gets little hospitality. Yeah, this one was uh, was interesting as well. It, at the end of the day, it seems like it's all about timing, like like being on time and and certainly both being on time in the sense of not being late because there's you know that that's frowned upon for various reasons but not being too early either and and i think it's sort of like that is how you succeed socially that's how you uphold the social contract in the best way possible it is is something like just it, if the world is is organized around time and things working on time you, you know if if you don't follow that you're Maybe not intentionally, but in some cases, certainly intentionally, it, you know, if, if you see it as being, you know, you're worthy of, of making someone wait or, you know, your presence is going to be so well liked that you can just come early, you know, barring normal everyday things, right? It's, it's also just a case of you're making society not run as efficiently as it could. And that's eventually going to make you unpopular and you are not going to get hospitality as easily at the end there. So for sure. And we, we see that a very similar idea in, in our time now with the idea of being fashionably late where, you know, if someone's having a party at let's say 6 PM, unless you're helping out because a lot of times friends will come early and help set up. And then it's like, that's totally normal and everything. But in general, you know, if they say a party starting at 6 p.m. and you're there, you know, 5.30, that's kind of a jerk thing to do because then it, they're still getting set up and now they have to also be a host to you and they're not, they're not prepared to be the, the best host that they want to be. And, it, and if you get there too late, then the partying will have been done and the, they'll, have to, they'll have to tend to hosting you as well, even though the the welcomings have already been done and that kind of thing. And the, the party has sort of moved on from that. If you're sort of like fashionably late, so it'd be like, I don't know, you get there at like 6, 10, 6, 15 or whatever. All the, all the little things have probably been done by then. They, the host has had a chance to sort of like exhale from setting everything up. And then it's a relaxed atmosphere and you can go in and that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm sure we could like find etiquette manuals from different decades, which would tell you sort of what fashionably late is, but it's just sort of the idea that you're not demanding your host to be perfectly ready right when they said that they would be ready, but you're also not showing up uh, super late or showing up super early where they have to take care of you and everything else. So it's one of those things that it's it's kind of an unwritten rule, even though we have it written down here, but it's kind of an unwritten rule of, you know, how you exist amongst your friends and in society and all that kind of stuff that you, you kind of have to figure it out as you go along. Agreed. And, and it really turns into, like, I like the causal nature of, of this stanza where it turns into like, if you, if you are coming too early or too late to some things, you know, then maybe that turns you into the hated man or the unpopular man and hospitality, you, you know, you, you get less of it. And I, I think that that's the concept that we've gotten into is that hospitality is always a two way street. It's, it's the role of the host and the guest to uphold the rules of hospitality. And I think this is commenting on here, the idea of the guest not fulfilling their end of the bargain. And then it'd be too strong a word to say, I think it's within the rights of people to sort of offer less hospitality, but maybe, maybe you do make fewer offers to that person. Or it's like, if you're there early consistently, it, it turns into like, okay, well, I'm not going to be the good host to you yet because I'm still, I'm still working on things or, Oh, you've come too late. Sorry. Like that's, that's too bad. You make a habit of this. Like, I, I don't know. It, I like the causal um, connection there where it's sort of like, if you don't do this, this is a good way to become unpopular. Which is the word that Larrington uses actually is unpopular. Oh, interesting. Absolutely. And absolutely. I think, I think that's exactly right. Shall I uh, go on to the next one? Let's do it. 
verse 67. Now and then I've been invited to a friend's house as long as I had no need for food or as long as I could make my inhospitable host cellars fuller rather than emptier. Yeah, this one was was uh, was quite different. I think the the connotation seems a little. It seems interesting. In a lot of ways, it seems like it's saying every once in a while it's okay to be invited along to a friend's house if there's not like an expectation of like a huge burden of hospitality all the time on the host. And I think that's that's something to do with the give and take of, of friendship, that kind of ebb and flow where it's like, you know, it's not always going to be like this big dinner party where you're going to get fed and get to drink your fill sort of thing. Sometimes it's just you're around to hang out because you want to spend time, right? But then the, then the, the point of, you know, saying my my inhospitable host you know you're invited over if you can make your inhospitable host cellars fuller rather than uh emptier i mean i i think that is almost a little overly negative here because I, the rest of the stanza almost seems i think it's positive to kind of have that relationship with someone where it's not always like a huge expectation you know when you're when you go over to someone's house or whatever and you're just kind of there to hang out and I, and I think if you, if you take the word inhospitable out there, I think this also implies that often the guest in, in these cases sometimes has the hospital, sorry, has the responsibility to kind of give back to their host in general. And, and that's just the, the underpinning of a positive relationship is that, you, you know, you're just trying to give back all the time and like, even like take advantage of not advantage, but you know, hospitality as a general rule, like fulfill the social contract and you, you know, enjoy the things that your, that your host offers to you. But, you know, sometimes still, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're the one who's going to bring the dinner to your, to your friend's house or something like that, because it was easier for you to pick it up on the way. And oh, no, don't worry about it. Like you, you get, you get me often enough. I'll, I'll get this one. Like, I think that's, I think that's what it's saying, but the word inhospitable kind of throws a wrench in that and almost turns it into a, a negative for not always being kind of on as a, as a host. And I think the rest of the stanza was kind of saying that. So I, I don't, I, in a lot of ways, I almost didn't know what to make about this stanza overall because of that word. Yeah. It's kind of tricky, especially if you, uh, <laughs> if you look at, uh, if you watch our, or listen to our episodes on the Grimace Mall, how serious the charge of inhospitable is like, that's, that's a big deal to say someone's inhospitable. It uh, It's kind of a, a funny uh, stanza. Where, where I went with it was maybe it's about the idea of how there are different, there are different types of friends, different levels of friendship. And I know when uh, in the Nicomachean ethics by Aristotle, he outlines the different types of friendships and I do think it, uh, he does a pretty good job of it actually, but he says friends, uh, are own, you can be friends th- sort of in three or four different, uh, situations. One's like friends through proximity. And this made me think of like, uh, classmates or coworkers where at, at work or in class, you're, you're friendly with each other, joking, that kind of thing, but you don't really hang out with each other outside of work or school. Uh, then there's friendship of utility. So you're useful to each other in some way and obviously not, not at odds with each other. So someone, one, you both have skills that the other one needs so that you can, uh, you can get ahead in life. But again, you're not, you're not like super close friends. Uh, this made me think of actually, uh, there's a, a magician duo called Penn and Teller that pretty famous, like one's a huge guy who does all the talking. The other guy's a mute, not actually what's part of the act, but uh, when you see interviews with them, they're not, they actually don't consider themselves friends, but they do consider themselves like really good business partners. And they, they don't, they don't really hang out. They don't go to each other's houses for, you know, birthday parties or their kids, whatever. Um, but they, they've worked together for decades and 
they'll talk about, you know, openly like disagreeing with each other, but they knew that they worked well to, with each other. So that, that was what was able to keep them, keep them together for so long. And that maybe if they, if it had been built around friendship rather than business, maybe they would have broken up. And I mean, you see that often in various uh, media forms where like bands breaking up and that kind of thing, because stuff gets in the way of the friendship rather than the, the band. And I think probably the most, one of the most famous examples of that would be the Eagles who, you know, they don't, they don't like each other personally, but they con they keep going on world tours because they're just like raking in the money hand over fist. So yeah, it's there, there, there is a, there is a use for like being useful to your friends that, and that, that being the basis of the, the friendship. Um, and then the ultimate form of friendship would be the, the one where you recognize the, the beauty and the goodness in another person's soul. And they recognize the beauty and goodness in your own soul. And then you actually work together to become more beautiful and more good. And that's sort of, that's the ultimate uh, type of friendship where you, you actually care about the other person's well-being and they care about yours and you're, you push each other to be the best that you can be. So I think what we're seeing here is that there isn't, this is definitely not that type of friendship. It's more the like proximity or usefulness, but even usefulness, you're not getting a meal out. So it's more proximity. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I really like that, that concept. First of all, it, ma it makes a lot of sense. And I mean, when you were talking, it was like, yeah, this sounds like coworkers. That was the first thing that you say, yeah, like coworkers and then utility. That's something that also makes sense. Like a, like a good business relationship, like it's something a little bit closer, but also not like that far. But then, you, you know, then there's those friends that stick around for years and years. And, and, you know, what's odd about that is that I, I almost see this, if it weren't for that, for the one word there, I would see this as being the, the last category. Absolutely. Because that's the sort of relationship you have, because it says now and then, right? Sometimes, you know, you, you, you want to go out of your way for your really good friends and, and, you know, be the good host and everything like that. But sometimes you just want to hang out and there's no big obligation. And I think you, I think you can tear away the facade of, of the, the social contract a little bit with your closest friends, not, not to sort of take advantage of them, but because you're so comfortable with each other. And I, I will be clear here, the Larrington translation does not say inhospitable. It doesn't put the onus on the, the host as being so, um, as, as them being the ones kind of at fault here in, in particular, it goes here and there, I might be invited home when I had no need of food that meal time. Or two hams would be hanging in a trusty friend's house when I'd already eaten one. So, I mean, that stands almost sounds like don't use up your friend's hospitality. And and the word trusty is actually even in there, right? So For sure. I think it's two, this is two quite different um, readings of the same stanza. And to, and to me, this is almost if it weren't for the one word in, in Crawford or, you know, if, if it's, if you're more looking at Larrington here, I think this really does point to the more the more comfortable long-term relationship you have with, with a good friend as opposed to proximity or utility. But the word inhospitable then points it towards the latter or the f former. I mixed myself up there, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean though? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, I guess it really is sort of the, the difference between uh, the word inhospitable and the word trusty and, and you get, and, and maybe that's all it takes for, like maybe that is the difference between like friend, like real friendship and sort of that, that friendship by proximity or whatever, where it's, you know, trust being trusty or trustworthy versus, um, even though in hospital is a very harsh, uh, charge to make against someone. So, well, that's right. And I mean, I think the thing here too, is that, you know, if you are really good friends with someone, you don't want to deplete their coffers, no, definitely not. right? But, but then if you're, and then by the flip side, if you're not great friends with someone, you want to, you want to go for, through the motions of the full social obligation with them too, I think. I think you're right. So it's interesting, uh, just some differences in the translations here, but they, they come out with very different, um, overall messages, right? I would agree, but, oh, not, but, and both messages are pretty pertinent. So that's the, uh, that's kind of the beauty of it too, is that there's, there's really good stuff in, in either interpretation. And I, 
there have been other things too where I've been shocked where there'll be like uh, not controversy but maybe debate over whether uh, something is one way or another in, in translations but both you can translate it both ways and get really good stuff out of both that's right I, I agree with that you, you can translate something so many different ways but all the ways are valuable and you might as well read more than one or two sure. and and then really try and get different perspectives ha huh, you should try and go out in there and get different perspectives there we go look at that meta living out the havamal as we read out the havamal awesome all right let's uh, move on verse 68 back to the poem fire is best for mortals and sunshine and also good health if you have it and living beyond reproach this one is interesting goes back into the mastery of fire first of all just a little bit kind of on the surface there and i mean we, we've already talked about that but i'll i'll just re-emphasize you know the the discovery of fire and the mastery of fire was was essential for human evolution and human progress and you know without it we probably wouldn't have uh started to get like the surplus of protein or and things like that that allowed our brains to grow and i i, I might be not getting that exactly right but that's that's the general gist of it i think and then the mastery of fire this this uh chaotic symbol of creation and destruction having mastery over that is really like putting your the putting chaos into order in your your own world and so fire is is good for mortals you know that's it's something that overall has turned into a tool instead of something that could kill you you still have to be careful with it but it's a tool a positive tool as opposed to something that is possibly a negative and then talk about sunshine you know, I mean, I, I think that's, first of all, one saying you should go outside into the world, not always be stuck indoors sort of thing. But also it's like an acknowledgement of the importance of sunshine, the sun. I mean, there were whole religions that were devoted to the sun. Um, famous one being uh, the Egyptian for a really long time uh, valorized the sun in, in many different forms uh, up to even worshiping the sun directly, not not even as a personification, but literally like the sun disc was worshiped uh, for a little period of time there. And and, uh, you know, it's, I think this is just, again, acknowledging the importance of the sun for the world, but then tying this all together with, you know, living beyond reproach. I mean, I think this is just kind of saying, here are some good things. And then it's also a good thing if you live your life in an upstanding way, something like that. It, it's slightly confusing exactly what this is getting at, but I think the, the gist of it is something positive like that, right? Absolutely. I would, I'd agree with that. I looked at it sort of as, you know, the best things in life and, uh, you know, fire is best for mortals. And, and I just think of all the, the good things that come from fire. So your warmth for living, uh, cooking food. So you're not getting sick off of raw meat and that kind of thing. Um, and then just, th there's also, I'd say a communal aspect around fire because, how long have humans been gathering around fire at night as a community and talking and sharing stories and all that kind of stuff? It's a very, uh, like primordial drive that we have to, to hang out around fire as a community, mostly because it was, uh, there's a, there's a lot of safety in the, the light that would shine and the warmth. So wild animals would be a little wary of coming up to the fire. If there's a big group of people around it, plus animals recognize fire as well. And, as something that will burn them. So it would uh, protect people and uh, sunshine. Well, we all know what is, how good it feels to be out in the sun, but like there are also some like real biological benefits to being out in the sun, especially in the North where uh, the sun is sort of at a premium. So uh, vitamin D production in the body, the, the best way to get it is through uh, sunlight and if you live in the northern hemisphere and particularly like more northern than you know close to the equator a lot of times you're actually looking to supplement your vitamin d because the sun uh, can't get hot enough or can't make your body warm enough to produce it and vitamin d is one of the most important vitamins 
I can, and I can speak to how important it is for men specifically, but I know it's also super important for women, but, uh, in men, it, it helps with the uh, production of, uh, like testosterone and things like that, which is super important. Uh, and then for both men and women, it's one of the, uh, one of the things that sort of uh, your immune system is based around. And so it just, the, the benefit from it is immeasurable. And I, I know a lot of people will, a lot of people in the fitness industry will say sort of like, if you only take one bit of advice from me is make sure you're getting enough vitamin D. And I, I remember, uh, I remember at one point in my life, I was feeling really tired and everything and just groggy and not feeling great. So I actually went to the doctor. I'm like, am I low in iron? I shouldn't be, but you know, what's going on? And they uh, tested me and found that I, I had a deficiency in vitamin D. So I started taking it as a supplement and it just changed everything. Like I hardly ever got sick after I had tons of energy. Like, and since then I've always made sure to take it because like living with, living with a vitamin D deficiency is brutal. So take your vitamin D people. It, it's awesome. Or uh, maybe alternatively, go out into the sunshine. Yes. Uh, and you know, I like, and I think they were kind of getting at this, maybe probably without knowing the science, but, you know, fire is best for mortals and sunshine and also good health. They, they link fire and sunshine to good health. Uh, and then living beyond rep- reproach. So it's not enough to just be healthy, but, you know, be honorable and be an upstanding person. So. Yeah, it's just, I think it, it really is like, you know, what it, how do you live the best life? And this is kind of a shorthand version of it. Agreed. I think you tied that together brilliantly. Like, uh, yeah, maybe I wasn't making the the right full connection there. But yeah, I think top to bottom, that's that's a great way to put it. Great summarization there. Yeah, the, the only other thing, like, I think I have written down, like, what is best in life when they go fire and sunshine and all like when everyone actually knows it's when you see your enemies driven before you and the lamentations of the women. Right. That's a, uh, that's Conan just by the way. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> some of the, some of you younger folks might not have seen the movie Conan the Barbarian. Definitely check it out. It's great, but it, then you'll get the reference. Good, good quote. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to uh, stanza 69 back to the poem. No one is totally wretched even if his health is bad. Some find happiness in their children, some in their kin, some in their money, some in work well done. So, you know, it's interesting here. So, previous stanza, we talk about how having good health is a key to living a good life. But then here, you know, if they're saying, you know, even if you don't have good health, you still can have something you know i i think it's saying you know even if even if your life isn't going great you should still look at those things that are going well for you the the things that you can find some fulfillment and and happiness in you know if even if you don't have everything you know you're, you're not uh you don't have the the house the two cars and the 2.5 children or whatever that was like the american ideal for however many years like you can still have something you you can still fulfill your life through you know your your children or your family in general or in you know like the work that you're doing right like th- that last line you know fulfill yourself in just the things you do i think that speaks to something like just try and do things that are meaningful do what is meaningful not what is expedient 12 rules for life um I think it's something like that. And this is so optimistic too, right? Like no matter how bad your situation is, you should still try and find something to to take, not even just solace in, but something like to point to, no, you, you still got something going for you. And I think the, the overarching point is something like, yeah, you still got something going for you. So you might as well keep trying. And I I don't want to get ahead of myself on this, uh, further stanzas are, I think is going to even make that even more clear too. But, you know, just for this one on its own, it's, it's, I, I like, especially the contrast to the previous stanza where they're like, okay, having good health is kind of a good thing for having a good life. But even if you don't have good health here, like that doesn't mean you're worthless, right? No, exactly. It, and we're, we're going to see it in the next stanza, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. 
I just see so much gratitude in this stanza where it's like, okay, yeah, your health is bad, but like, look at how great having children is, you know, like, or, you know, your family or, you know, you're wealthy, like things aren't that bad. Uh, or, you know, or you're working well and people respect your craftsmanship or how hard you work. Like, I, I think it's about finding the, the silver lining in life and, and being thankful for it. And that, that can really change uh, your perspective on, on things. If you're always looking at the negative, well, you're also going to have a negative attitude and no one's going to want to be around you. And it, and it just, it doesn't just sort of further the, the downward spiral, but it also accelerates it so that you're, it's like snowball effect, right? So, but it, it works the same way that if you're, you know, if these things aren't going right, and I mean, life's pretty hard and terrible. So we all have things that aren't going exactly right. But if you can find the things that are going right, and you focus on them, it, it wanted to lift your spirits, and it actually might make other things start going right as well. The, um, the last line uh, about finding uh, sort of joy in work well done, it, it made me think of uh, again, Jordan Peterson talking about, you know, whatever job you're doing and it, and it could be like di- literally like dishwasher or, you know, whatever, do it the best that you can, like really take pride in it because better things will come out of it. it it's the, it's the act of working hard and honestly, that is going to get you further in life. No matter, like we all have to start out somewhere. And it, it doesn't, uh, and it doesn't matter as long as you, you put your nose to the grindstone and work hard at it, that will, that will move you up the, the dominance hierarchy. Yeah. It wasn't something like a progression of like, if you're a dishwasher for a while, maybe you'll get to become a short order cook, which Jordan Peterson actually did. And then, you know, maybe you start to run the, the, the night shift or you're the head chef or something like that. And, you know, maybe eventually you're a manager. I mean, that's, that's a path forward and up the dominance hierarchy. Yeah, exactly. And it's just because you're, you're taking a bit of pride in your work and making sure that you get it done right. So there's definitely no, it, it is one of the most hopeful things I've, I've read probably in anything is just that no matter how bad things are, like there, there are silver linings and be thankful for what you can do. So exactly. And, and I mean, it, I, I also like what's just as hopeful is that there are different options for fulfillment. Like you don't always have to do what society says you should, you know what I mean? Like, it's not always like, there's not always going to be one path for for living a good life and living a fulfilled life. You can, you can get it through so many different ways. And I think a lot of it is just about learning what that means for yourself and, and how you can find that and, and really use it, you, you know, use it to lo- use your knowledge of yourself to craft the life that is going to be meaningful and fulfilling for you. Very hopeful. Absolutely. I think we'll move on to the next one. Cause it's also hopeful. Quite related. Yeah. Verse 70, better to be alive no matter what than dead. Only the living enjoy anything. I saw a rich man's house, but it was on fire and he lay dead outside the door. So this is so life affirming, right? Like it's, it's very much like if you're dead, you, what's the point? Like, I don't know. There's there's a lot to this. I mean, first of all, the imagery at the end there, a rich man's house, but it's on fire and he's dead. Like, (laughs) it's not just, I saw a rich man's house, but it was on fire. So first of all, well, okay, that's a bad situation. And he was dead. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, it gets, uh, it doesn't hold any punches. It's just like, no, his house is on fire. So his stuff's gone and he's dead. (laughs) (laughs) No, I thought that was really funny, but but it, it makes so much sense too, though. It's like, if you, I think it's something like if you, if all you do is just accumulate wealth and power and things, but you don't enjoy it and you don't get actual fulfillment out of it, you, you know, eventually things will decay. You, you know, maybe it will get burned up literally, but you know, things will decay is the other side of it. You know, if, if you don't, if you, if you let things go, right. But then, you know, eventually you die and it's like, well, what do you get out of it? But if you're, if you're alive, no matter what your situation is and, and you can enjoy life, well, then there you go. You can enjoy life, right? Exactly. And so 
you know, with, with the rich man, he had all this great stuff, but he was dead. He can't enjoy it. So, like, it, 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 it's tragic. And that's why it is better to be alive no matter. And I love how they say no matter what. Like, it's... Uh, it's it's really hopeful. It's no matter how bad things are, it's better to be alive because you can still find enjoyment or work towards finding enjoyment. That as long as as long as you're breathing, there's hope because you can you can move forward and whatever si- terrible situation you're in, you have the power to get yourself out of it. So yeah, just I love it. It's and I one of the reasons I love it is I I actually don't think we hear a lot of that kind of stuff in in our culture today. So it's nice to be able to look back and see that actually like being alive and enjoying life is worth something or everything really. That's right. Like, I mean, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot out there that sort of says, you know, you, you, your life is only worthwhile if, if you, contribute this bare minimum to society or something like that. And I mean, in a lot of cases, it's, it's sort of true that, you know, you should be upholding the social contract, you know, hospitality and all that. But it's also like, no matter who you are, no matter your place in society, you, you can still be valuable and you can still live a fulfilled and enjoyable life. I mean, the, in the last episode, I think we talked about the essentially the necessity of, of charity. And I think that's, that points to something like this, you know, if, even if someone is just down and out, you know, they're, they're not dead yet. That's still salvageable, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. As long as, uh, yeah, as long as you're breathing, there's, there's room to, uh, to grow and improve and make things better. So make things better for yourself for society in general just to to have a good impact like there's always that possibility no matter who you are it's great yeah so very uh very hopeful and let's go on to the next one which is also hopeful you know it's funny vikings have this reputation of you know bloodthirsty raiders but who would have thought that they had they had such a hopeful outlook on life now i know vikings were only like a blink of an eye in their culture, but the way we view them now, it's, it's kind of funny that, uh, we're getting such like hopeful. And I, I even say like gentle and uplifting messages from, from their culture. So exactly. A limping man can ride a horse. A handless man can herd. A deaf man can fight and win. It's better even to be blind than fuel for the funeral pyre. What can a dead man do? Yeah, you know what I mean? This is this is just continuing the same thread here from the from the last couple of stanzas, right? It's it's like do what you can, no matter what. Like even even if it's hard, do what you can. Like it's talking about some, you know, disabilities, right? You know, limping or handless or deaf or, or blind, but you, you know, you can still do something with your life. And I mean, I think this is an acknowledgement that, you know, in general, life isn't fair and nature isn't fair. Some people are going to be, you know, fully able-bodied and some people aren't, or some people are going to have the skills and abilities and, and the, the capabilities to do many things and that, that others aren't, but no matter who you are in your situation, you can still do something. And there's, there's value in, doing something. There's value in hard work. There's value in contributing to society in general, you know? And I mean, yeah, like what can a dead man do? Nothing. Not nothing. Nothing. No, it, it, uh, it reminds me again of, uh, Jocko because yes, he's got the, uh, the hardcore getting up at four thirty and, you know, doing Olympic lifts and squats. And I think he's got like those hanging rings as well. But uh, not everyone's up to that level of, of fitness. But he, he always says, do what you can. Because one, if you want to get to that level of fitness, you're going to have to go through those steps. So do what you can so you can grow. But also because it's still, it's still good for you to, if you're doing what you can, you're still getting the maximal benefit out of it. Like it, just because sort of the maximal benefits are different for different people, you're still getting the best that you can out of it. So yeah, like in life, do what you can and do it to the best of your ability and good things will happen. Agreed. You know, this this cycle of roughly three stanzas here is is really fantastic. It's just the, the outlook is so great. It's, it's really like 
no matter who you are, no matter your situation. And it's really speaking to people where who are down and out or, or even have a disability or something like that. You can still be valuable. You can still do something. You can still contribute. Not not saying that that's the only worth of a person is what they contribute to society, but that's also for your own self-fulfillment. You know, you, you can still do things for your own self-fulfillment and live a good life, live a happy life that's not fully dependent on charity or on other people. And I, I mean, that was a nuance as well last time where it was like, you know, the goal shouldn't be to live under charity for your entire life. But, you, you know, if you have to make use of it, that's also fine because it's like, yeah, society's goal should be to lift you back up and get you back to being a, a good, happy person that is living well, right? It's the whole thing. It's it's great. Yeah, absolutely. It just a very hopeful, uh, hopeful message. Shall we uh, move on? Sure. All right. Verse 72, back to the poem. Better to have a son than not, even if he's born late in life, even if he's born after you die. You'll rarely see memorials or graves standing near the road that were raised for men without sons. So this one is is interesting. It's also very clear to me what the message is here. Have kids. And it's interesting in one sense because I think it is act, it, it is pointing towards or getting at something uh, another concept, the concept of legacy, which we're getting a a shade ahead of ourselves here. We got a couple of stanzas coming up that very much get into the idea of legacy. But the the idea here, I, I, and the only the only bit I'll talk about about that at all is that legacy is is considered huge, and we'll we'll see why this episode. We will see why. But the idea the warning is almost like if you if you don't have kids you know you're not going to leave a legacy whether that's you know in the literal sense of them living on literally living on or them making memorials and telling your stories and and i and i think this does also get into the the nuance a little bit of you can have metaphorical children sort of like if you leave such a huge impression on on the world or on people in general like you can have metaphorical children who are going to, you know, talk about the words that you said or your deeds and everything like that. And and you will live on that way. But it definitely, I think it's clear that you'll, you rarely see that, you know, you rarely see memorials for people that were raised for people without sons. And it, and, and to me, that's, that's really just end of the day, having kids is a, is a positive thing to do. And and I mean, in society these days, that's not always emphasized anymore. Like there's a famous time magazine cover where it talks about like the child free life and how that's a good thing. But you know, the, the dark side to that is that, you know, people can become really unfulfilled if they, if they end up not having kids and regretting it. And, and I mean, that's, that's not just, I'm not just pulling that out anecdotally. Like there's, there's tons of people who have said that. And I think studies done and, and, Lots, uh, lots about, you know, the consequences of not having kids and not taking that responsibility. And to be clear, it is a huge responsibility, but it's also here very much. Uh, the answer is you should. Well, yes, it, that's exactly it. It's a huge responsibility, probably the biggest responsibility, but it also brings you apparently if you know, my parents are, <laughs> if our parents are anything to go by, if they've told you this, that, you know, they, it's a great reward as well. Like all the, uh, all the pain you've put your parents through, like if you were to ask them, like, would you, would you do all again? I think most of them say absolutely. Like there are terrible parents out there. Don't, don't get me wrong. But in general, the idea is that your parents love you. And, you know, even if you put them through hell every now and then, they still love you and they still wouldn't change the fact that they, that they had you. And I think a lot about, you know, ha- having kids, there's a, there's a few like good reasons. One is that there's sort of that idea of immortality, like you were talking about passing it on in your legacy. Uh, but also that, 
you know, you're going to need someone to take care of you when you, when you grow old and feeble. And, and actually we see it uh, like in Western civilization with, I mean, record low birth rates, more and more people are having to depend on, on the government to take care of them when they, when they're older. And that's just like, that's not the guard. Like the government doesn't care about you the way that your kids are going to care about you. So the care you're getting is like substandard is charitable. You know, it is a charitable way to describe it. Like it's, it's pretty awful. So like having kids and having people that will take care of you when you're older, one, I think it's, it's kind of that natural cycle where you took care of them and then they're taking care of you. But it also like just very selfishly, it's, it's a better kind of an insurance or investment plan than depending on social programs and the government to do it for you because they don't care about you they're, and they're going to do, you're, you're literally just a number to them, like a file number and they will like, they will happily save money off of your back so that for, for whatever reason, like there's, so that there are very practical reasons to have children as well. Well, and I mean, uh, to your point, I would also say that there's, there's maybe an aspect of preparedness, you know, people in general should save money for their own retirement. Definitely. And so, I mean, uh, even if you don't have kids, you know, you've still put money away to be able to, to retire comfortably and, you know, not, not just, you know, go, uh, not just for your own basic care, but to be able to go on trips and enjoy life as a retired person. You know, I, I think to be able to do that, you, you should have saved some money. I'm like, I would definitely say it's not the government's responsibility to, to pay for your trips around the world when you're, when you're retired. But, but you, you, you know, as society in general, as we've talked about, like, you know, some part of that responsibility of caring for, you know, the previous generation, that's certainly there, but realistically, like with, with these low birth rates, it's, it's going to become impossible to maintain the cycle of, you know, the, the current generation, the current taxpayers are paying for the previous generation's retirement. And I mean, if that continues on and on and on, and we have these record low birth rates, that's, that's not going to be feasible. And it really is going to turn into at some point, it's going to be like, no, like we have to have massive cuts to social security or the, I forget what our equivalent actually like the Canadian pension plan or something like that in Canada here. But you know, the result is going to have is going to be catastrophic for many people. And it's, it's just going to turn into a, a case of like us as society has not prepared for the, the inevitable, um, deterioration in, in what we can afford because, you know, you, you can't just say taxes are going to pay for it. You can't do it because if there's fewer people paying for other people to live longer as well, you know, seniors are living longer, and it's like the vast majority of your retirement gets used up in like your last five years of life or something like that, because you're just, your medical expenses are astronomical by that point. It's like, as people start to live longer and, and start to work for a, for a smaller portion of their lives, you know, that's not going to be sustainable. Right. And, and I think it turns into like, you have to be prepared and you have to put away money for your own retirement. And, and, you know, if you have kids as well, you know, have money set aside so that you're going to give them some kind of inheritance too. And it's all of the things turn into like, uh, you know, to, to bring it back around to having kids. Yeah, certainly that would help. But even if you didn't have kids or even if you, you know, your kids don't like you or something like that. And that's another point I want to tie this back into, um, you, you know, that you still have the resources to take care of yourself, even in your old age. But I, I think the, uh, a point here is that in order to have a legacy, they're talking about, you know, one, you, you have to have kids, Two, you need to do good deeds worthy of telling, right? So, I mean, like, even if you have kids who love you, what are they going to say if you've accomplished nothing with your life, right? Like, you, for sure. I mean, maybe the best they can say is like, okay, you gave me a good life, and I'm I'm grateful for that. But you know, there's not going to be any monuments to you, right? And then you got to have a good relationship with your kids so that they'll actually want to put up these monuments to you or, or tell your stories or, or care for you in your old age. And that's not a given. That's absolutely not a given. There's some, there's some terrible parents out there and there's some, and there's some terrible kids out there, you know, and, but you know, that's their upbringing or, or whatever. And there's a lot of factors to it, but I think that's the threefold thing here. And that's what you have. Maybe that's the key to unlocking a good legacy is that you do great things have kids and your kids actually like you. 
That sounds pretty tough, actually. <laughs> that sounds really that's hard, a, right? Yeah, that's a, a tall order. So yeah. it's still hopeful, but now you're actually starting to see like what you have to do to. Well, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest. Like, I'm currently in a phase of life where you know my wife and I are are actually regularly discussing. You know, do we think we're going to have kids? And I mean, our answers to that question have gone from a few years back, like hard no, to definitely not for at least a few years to now we're actually seriously saying, okay, like in the next couple of years, we have to make a decision. Like, do we want to have kids? And, and then it turns into, yeah, I think we want to have kids, but holy, that is one heck of a responsibility. Right. And it's, it's, it's hard. Like I find myself wanting to have more time to become more established in my career. I want to find more I want, I want to be able to accomplish more before I have kids because then I want to throw myself into that with everything I have because being a father, I can't think of any greater responsibility. And, you, you know, if, if I, I don't want to be one of those absent fathers as well. And, and I mean, certainly there's, there's something to do with like the traditional division of labor when it comes to, you know, you, you have the breadwinner father and you're, and you, you know, the, the mother is at home sort of thing. I don't think that's, that was the answer. Maybe it was sort of more a biological thing or just the way society organized itself these days. I think there's something to the idea of just, at the very minimum, you, you, you know, even if both parents are, are are working, which is the norm these days, it, they still need to be giving their all to their kids. Like, and, and that's really it for me is that, you know, I, I feel like I'm just, I'm too selfish to give up that free time to to a kid. But, but really, that's just me making an, an excuse. And, and at the end of the day, I think it's, it's an obligation to have kids, but at the same time, if I'm if I'm going to at all, the obligation is also there to be the best father that I possibly can be. And so it's 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 hard because that responsibility is there and it's looming. And I think the the consequences not not to be completely selfish about it, but the consequences about you you know if I, I really do not want to screw up a kid, you know, and and I guess the consequence of that for me is is that uh, I might not get to leave a legacy sort of thing. And I mean, that shouldn't be the only thing driving it for you. But for me, it's like, I really do not want to screw up a kid. And that makes this, that makes the choice of whether or not to have kids huge, a, a weighty, weighty decision and loads of responsibility. But reading something like this is sort of like just that push in that direction where it's like, yeah, you know, I should. It's, it's something that at the end of the day, even though it's hard, even though it's going to require lots of sacrifices, it, at the end of the day, it, it, it should be, you, you should do it. it. It's something worthwhile. I think that's what this is saying. I think that's something that has been devalued in society in general. And, you know, it, it's, it's also just a hard decision, you know, bringing a kid into the world where, you know, wh one thing that we, we've said is we want to, we only want to have kids if we think that they would like the life that we're giving them. And sometimes I don't know if that's, if that's the case. Sometimes I don't know if I've, I've done enough to be able to provide them safety and security and, and provide them with all the opportunities to be able to live their own good life. But at the end of the day as well, it sort of turns into, well, if I'm not going to now, you know, maybe it's never going to happen. So it's, it's just, that's my own personal, um, struggles with this question and my own personal, what I've, what I get out of reading something like this is, yeah, at the end of the day, probably that's the answer is you should have, you should have kids. You should take that risk, take that, take up that responsibility because the rewards are the greatest they possibly could be. So. Yeah, I think uh, I think you basically touched on all like the the pertinent questions to ask when when you're thinking about having kids and all that kind of stuff. Like you have to think about that, and if you're if you're going going to do it sort of consciously and and going into it. So yeah, no, it's a uh, like you're saying it's a, the probably the biggest responsibility, but also the the one that offers the most reward. So yeah, it's a uh, 
good stanza and just like a, a real question to ask yourself in life. So that's awesome. Shall we move on? Yeah, that's it for me on that one. Verse 73, back to the poem. Two men will defeat one. Your tongue can endanger your head. In every hand hidden by a cloak, I expect to see a weapon. Yeah, so another interesting one. Two will defeat one. I think this has come up before, but maybe just to reiterate other points on this, like this, this almost points to the, the pointlessness of tyranny, the, the pointlessness of, you know, the, the top of the dominance hierarchy only being populated by tyrants. It's unstable. Eventually you get killed. You know, I mean that, I think that that happened to Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi and all that even though they were very good for their stability of their countries. And I don't want to get into that, but uh, you know, it, it's just something like two chimpanzees, three quarters, the strength of one leader who is, you know, tyrannical and all that they'll tear, tear him apart. And you need to have those reciprocal relationships and you, you need to do that in order to survive in society. And so, you know, don't isolate yourself. I think we've already talked about that, but your tongue can endanger your head. Like, Oh yeah, we've talked about that. You know, you 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 can endanger yourself with uh, idle speech or uh, uncareful, non-careful speech, and I mean that's uh, that's definitely quite something there. And then I mean to to round this thing off, in every hand hidden by a cloak, you expect to see a weapon. Like I think that's just a call to vigilance in general, because it's like you know if you assume that everyone is is hiding a weapon sort of thing and you you know you're going to be prepared and you're going to be cautious and you're going to look a, at the world around you and and be careful and i mean it might be a pleasant surprise if if the people around you aren't carrying weapons but you know why would you assume that they don't if it's more dangerous to your health that uh, you know if they do and, and you're not prepared right so for sure interesting little combination of a few things here yeah, I I really like this uh, the stanza. I like the sort of the visuals and the the very practical advice. And I think of it too as like one, to, you know, don't don't get into a fight where the odds are against you. I'm sure you, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure you could find that somewhere in the art of war where you want to you want to have the odds uh, stacked in your favor. And of course, your tongue can endanger your head. Yeah, we've. Not only in the Havamal, but we've we've talked about that many times where you can say something stupid and then uh, pay for it. Uh, this one I, I like in every hand hidden by a cloak. I expect to see a weapon because I think for, I know for myself, I definitely don't do that. And I'm, I'm wondering if I should start thinking like that, that just to be more, more vigilant in, uh, in situations because because it's not it's not saying expect the worst it's just saying expect that other people can take care of themselves or take, can take care of their own business they aren't useless and so if you're going to be out in the world with other people who aren't useless you, you better not be useless as well yeah it's not necessarily saying you know be armed but maybe it is saying be capable of dealing with it if the people around you are which I think you can maybe draw your own conclusions mm-hmm. on that or or have your own idea of how you become competent to be able to handle that sort of situation. For sure. But yeah, I think it's uh, I, I think it's great advice and I think it kind of harkens back to the very beginning of the Havamal where I was talking about, you know, when, maybe not the very beginning. Well, the first first, yeah, going out and making sure that uh, you've got friends around every corner, not enemies. And then uh, later on talking about, you know, don't take one step without your sword. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Like, look look around at every doorway, right? Yeah. Like, that's that's the same concept, right? Exactly. All right. Moving on to verse 74. The seaman is glad at evening, looking forward to his dinner, with just a short distance to row home. But an autumn night is untrustworthy. Many things can get worse in only five days, and even more in a month. Okay, so this one was the the metaphor here 
almost was a little hard to kind of get through here, but I think what it what it's saying is that you can predict the short term but not the long term. Like this this seaman is happy in the evening because he can predict that he's going to go home and, you know, enjoy his dinner and enjoy his evening and all that. But, you know, maybe beyond that, like you can't predict five days or a, or a month ahead in advance, like exactly what's going to happen. Like this is why we make, you know, you can make firm plans, you know, you know, months in advance because, you know, they're big, important events in your life, you know, vacations or something like that, or, you know, a big concert or something like that. And then you circle the date on the calendar and all that. But I mean, who's to say you are not going to be say offered a job in a different town or something like that and you, and you can't make it or you're going to fall ill or something like that or a family member is going to die or some like anything could happen within that period of time and so you know you make big plans and you act in the world with all the intention of fulfilling those plans but sometimes things happen and and so just end of the day i think that's what this is saying is you cannot necessarily predict what's going to happen in the long term even if you can be pretty good at that in the short term if you've ordered your life in a certain way. Absolutely. The idea or the, the visual of the autumn night that is untrustworthy. I mean, for me, I, I love that one because it's some autumn nights are beautiful. You can be at, like on a patio, you know, having fun with your friends, that kind of thing. And other nights just bitterly cold. And, you know, it's, it's not unusual, especially in the more northern re regions that you get the big snowstorm in the autumn, right? And, you know, if you were, uh, if you were out of doors, living out of doors, like that's a serious thing to contend with. And then, especially like, I love that they use the example of the sea and, and sailing in that too, because the sea can change like in the snap of a finger, like you, the, uh, the waves can rise and, you know, a storm can sort of swirl up and it'll change the whole demeanor of the day. So you could have been out and it was a nice day, but the store comes by, or a storm comes by and you're now like sailing for your life to get back to shore. And that's why I think at the beginning, they, uh, there's the emphasis on the short distance to row home. It's that he, they didn't go too far out. Um, they didn't go too far out in, in chaos and the longer, you are exposed to chaos. Obviously the more chaotic things are going to get. And it's, I would say too, that it's not a, a linear progression of chaos. It's, it would be exponential that it just, it builds on each other to the point where it, it, it will overwhelm you. And that we talk about chaos and I like that we're, we're careful to, to mention that there's, there's potential there. It's not just, it's not bad. It's just dangerous. And there's potential there, but there is sort of an idea that you can't spend your whole life in chaos because that will, that will destroy you. That's why you, there's that emphasis put on having one foot in instability and one foot in chaos so that you can sort of shift between the two as needed, but you, you can't, you don't want to do exclusively one or the other. Sure. And, and you know, that was a good point that you, the metaphor is that kind of every day is a, is a journey into the unknown, not too far, but you, you know, unless you have the most boring job in the world, no, not, not even I, like any, any time that you, that you leave your house is really a, is really a, a venture into the unknown. Right. And, and I mean, it's like, if you put yourself out there and are doing a hard day's work sort of thing, you, you are putting yourself out into chaos, but probably not too far though. If you have a, like a predictable job, that's, that's safe. And, and you understand what's going on there. Yeah. I, I like that. That's, that's the metaphor there. I think that fits really well. Good to move on. I, I am. Sounds good. Verse 75. The ignorant man does not know how little he knows. You become foolish by listening to fools. One man is rich, another man is poor. Neither has the other to blame. Oh, <laughs> the, the end there is what really gets me, actually. I'll start at the beginning, though. Like, I, I think this is really just saying, you know, you, you often don't know how little you know or, or you think you're smart, but you, you know very little. Like, it, it's sometimes you like it's just hard to know that, right? Like. And I, and I think the answer that they're implying here is to, is to be humble and to, 
you, you know, li- live your life speaking to good people, right? You become foolish by listening to fools. I mean, if you get stuck in a situation where you're just listening to fools, and I, I think that's the same sort of echo chamber stuff that they were kind of talking about earlier. I say they, Odin. It's the same. It's the same sort of thing that Odin was talking about earlier, where it's where it's like uh, you're just stuck in that kind of echo chamber, and you're not ever going to learn something. You're not ever going to transfer knowledge to and from yourself, right? But you know the <laughs> the end of the stanza here, though, and and I think I think it. I think it relates and I'll get to that. But oh man, the end of this stanza, like one man is rich, another man is poor. Neither one has the other to blame. Man, that is something that we just do not seem to get as society at the moment here. It seems like it's all this class struggle where it's like the poor need to rise up against the rich because the rich have unfairly taken all these things from them. And then from the flip side, I think you get serious neoconservative things where it's like they're blaming the poor for not being productive enough, for sure. essentially. And it, it's like both sides, you're absolutely wrong here. It's like the concept of the 1% in general is is like, yeah, okay, this is the most successful part of society, but the membership in that is not always you, you know it's it's not the same people they, 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 it goes in and out as as people work hard and have success and i mean i don't want to get too too far into that right now but mostly because we we will actually cover more of this uh later i think but uh no it's it's like ah oh, in, in a lot of ways here it's just like us as society if, if you just stop blaming others for your own situation no matter what that is it's like well, then all you got is yourself and you can live your life the way you want to live it and work hard and maybe you will succeed. Like that's, that's what this says here. And that's, that's ultimately the, the hopeful message. Imagine, imagine if it was completely out of your control, that would be awful because you'd just be subject to it. But there's, there's hope there because it, they can't blame each other. It's, it's based on who they are and what it's based on themselves. And that, that ultimately gives you the power to change your station in life. Um, I knew when we read that, that would be the sort of the controversial uh, thing, but it goes back to like, just to touch on class stuff a little bit more, you know, just so that we piss off everyone equally. Um, There, it's just what it is. It's it's a dominance hierarchy, and there have been dominance hierarchies for millions of years, and like, and dominance hierarchies that have informed our the way we perceive dominance hierarchies for millions of years. So, the the current idea that this is all kind of new and that kind of stuff is is just completely. It couldn't be more wrong. Like it, it's wrong by millions and millions and millions of years. So th- this type of this type of thing has always been going on and and I could see how people would think well it's not fair and all this kind of stuff and and it isn't fair but that that's life like the, these are the the cards that you know being humans have been dealt by evolution and all that kind of stuff. So it's sort of this is where we are and I'm going. I'm going to hazard a guess that we're not going to change that through some brand new shiny like way of organizing ourselves politically. It's just like we don't have that kind of capability, and chances are the more that we try to like have overarching, uh, I guess, political systems that would address this and e- even it out, the more likely we're going to screw it up royally and just destroy everything because systems that are this complex you can't like even if you just tweak it a little bit the the outcomes are vast and usually unknown in in a lot of things like you tweak one thing to change it but okay you've changed this but now what's the ripple effects well imagine changing the whole system there's virtually no likelihood that you're going to make things better exactly and and i mean i think there there is a point to the idea that there is a lot of inequality in the world and and ultimately that that is there is a negative to rampant inequality as in like 
wealth and power rapidly concentrating in the the very 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 top and i mean that that is a thing and that is also a danger but the way we deal with it socially is not necessarily take everything away from all these people at the top you know that there are some statistics about poverty in the world and the the level of poverty in the world in the last 20 years has dropped precipitously just through in general the world becoming a better place through you know in some cases social initiatives but also you know people just caring about a problem in the world and trying to fix it and then it makes life better for millions of people sometimes in one go and and i mean we're we're alleviating poverty and and the world is overall becoming a better place and you know the, for all the for all the talk about you know the evil 1% in the world i mean if if you're listening to our show you're probably in the the top 1% in the world possibly not because you know the the access of uh of cell phones and uh and the internet and things like that and uh um the what have you computers it, it's becoming more and more uh, accessible, but uh, but a lot of the people listening here, even if you don't know it, you are in the global one percent in a lot of cases. And so, I mean, if you're railing against yourself, that's a little counterproductive. But at the end of the day, it it turns into like th- there is a problem. It is a problem if all the wealth and power in the world gets concentrated in like the top point zero 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 one percent of the population. But what do you like? Well, what are you going to do about that? All the solutions that have been tried that's going to even out that inequality you know the result is often like the the removal of all the productive people in the world is is what and what happens there and then you get gigantic famines you know the the holodomor in ukraine or uh the the results of the the khmer rouge in cambodia just completely wiping out the the urban classes and anyone educated is like well there you go there's your utopia it's on the backs of millions of deaths and everyone feels oppressed like what are we going to do? So, I mean, I think, I think I'm personally going to stop here with just saying like, I don't think we have the answers. And I, I think maybe it's at the very least a good step would be to not blame other people for, for their own situation. And if you improve yourself and you improve the situation for your family, your community, your, your country, you know, go outward and outward and outward, you know, maybe it will all become a better place overall. You're not going to solve all these problems overnight, and you're especially not going to solve all these problems by trying to throw out all of the the centuries and millennia of, of history and tradition that have gotten society to where it is today. Improve upon it, but definitely don't throw it out. Absolutely. That, that's uh, where I was going to go with it, too, is that the answer is kind of in there is that no one has the other to blame. And that So take it upon yourself to be the best person you can be. And then that will ripple out into your family and then into the society and all like, and it's, it is one thing to to say these things and think, Oh, isn't that nice? You know, it, it'll magically ripple out, but no, it actually, you actually do act differently when you are taking stock of yourself and trying to be better and it will actually improve your life. And then, by virtue of that, you'll actually have more time to improve the lives of people around you. And so it, yeah, it, that, that is the answer is to improve yourself, improve what you can control first, and then your sphere of control will start to expand. And ultimately, um, you'll be, you'll actually be able to change something in the world if you attain that amount of mastery over yourself. And like you were saying, you we are literally living in an age where humans have had it or have it the best they've ever had. And like the poorest people in the world are not as poor as they were a hundred years ago by far. Like think of like, and I mean like, like the third world country, like just living conditions that we would consider like horrible and abysmal are still way better than they were a hundred years ago for people in the, in the same situation. So things are getting better. And if, if we were to just throw everything out, we would, we would throw that out too. So it, you don't want to get rid of everything. You want to, you want to make incremental changes that you can actually have some control over the outcomes, even though it's difficult and hard. So, 
you know, there, there was the idea of, uh, of a rising tide lifts all boats. And that was a, that was a big part of you know, Reaganomics and trickle down economics in a lot of cases, which, which in fairness, in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, that was not a complete success anyway, that, that economic system. But then, then I think you also have the, the flip side to it where, you, you know, in a lot of cases, things do kind of trickle up to the top. It, my, my point is actually that there is a little of both. It's like, yes. Okay. So, a lot of the most successful people in the world, they're going to, they're the ones who work hard, are intelligent because you, you cannot be in the top, uh, like the, the top most successful people. If you're not intelligent, driven, you know, super into one thing, like that's the most successful people on the planet these days. Like you're, your Bill Gates is of the world or you're uh, Jeff Bezos or, uh, Elon Musk. Right. But it's like, these people were driven, driven, and and they they went for it hard, and they are super intelligent and super hardworking. Not everyone has that, but many people, you know, are intelligent enough and successful enough and hardworking enough to make a nice life for themselves. And those people are still going to be more successful than the people who, who aren't, right? And then it so so it, it is going to concentrate in people who are like that. But at the same time, things are getting better for the world as a whole. So, so my point, my point actually is that there's a little of both. There's a little bit of that actual inequality that is going to become an issue if it turns into Jeff Bezos has literally all the money and no one else has any other money. Then society might need to rethink itself a little bit. But, but it is the case that we are getting better as a, as a whole, as a planet, the world is getting better over time as we go here just by the improvements that are being made. So it's a, it's a little of both. You, there's, there's always a balance, right? For sure. And I think it's worth noting, like you don't want, you don't want people stacking up at zero where they have nothing. Right. So you, because that, uh, that's like the quickest way to de- destabilize a society. Um, so you definitely want to be able to to give people the opportunity for movement across across class or the strata or whatever. Um, so th- there's also that to to consider that you know you you do, just because you can't uh, either one can't play in the other one that doesn't mean there isn't uh, room for sort of help and. Uh, I don't want to say compassion because that that's not because you actually wouldn't need it. You would just need to recognize that having everyone stack up at zero is terrible for even for yourself. It could be very selfish. Um, but just that realization that having the most amount of people being productive is is the best outcome, really. So what is it? What is it that will get you there? And that's sort of the I guess the devil's always in the details, and that would be the the main details to work out is how do you get there without uh, wrecking everything. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I mean, I, th- I think I like what you said about, you know, you don't want people stacking up at zero. And I, and I think the answer that society has sort of been trying anyway, and it seems to be working sort of is that, you know, Oh, you're at zero. Okay, here, let's get you back in the game. And, but, but then you get into cases where, you know, maybe that maybe the gets abused sometimes, or people are content sitting at very, very near zero and, and you know, just, just getting by. And I mean, certainly those people aren't being productive, but sometimes like, what can you do sometimes you can't, you can't always motivate everyone. And I mean, th- there's gotta be room for that sort of, it, it just, you know, you, you have to understand that if you're unmotivated, you don't want to work and, and, or very much anyway, and you don't want to, you know, climb the dominance hierarchy. Well, then you're going to be stuck barely getting by having no money for entertainment. And you, you know, that's, that's just going to be the situation for your life. And I think you have to make, you may, you have to make a decision. You're either going to play the game or you're not going to play the game. And I mean, as society, we have to try and get people into the game. And if the result of that is, you know, sometimes there's going to be some kind of abuse of that, or you're, or you see people who just spin their wheels and, and don't ever try and put anything back in, you know, if, if we, if we get people back into society, get people back into the game and, and it works like, you know, maybe that's the, that's the trade off, right? For sure. No. Cause what happens if you have people dropping out of the game, they, uh, like there's no more fertile ground for resentment to build. And then, uh, for sort of the more, uh, cane type, 
uh, qualities to come out. And then, you know, whoever has, whoever they have deemed as the, the, the cause of their pain, they're going to go out and kill them. We, I mean, we see this, unfortunately, pretty regularly now. So, yeah. I actually didn't expect uh, to get all that out of that one. Like, no, I, I didn't. But but I did see that last couple of lines and I was like, oh, man, that's yeah. a good one. <laughs> I definitely thought we would uh, we would touch on it, but yeah. no, that was that was a good one. That was good. Shall we uh, move on? Yeah, sounds good. And uh, the, we're, I'm going to do two verses, seventy six and seventy seven, and it's the most famous passage from from the Havamal, and uh, I, we're looking forward to talking about this one. Very much so. So starting with verse seventy six, back to the poem. Cows die, family die, you will die the same way. But a good reputation never dies for the one who earns it well. Cows die, family die, you will die the same way. I know only one thing that never dies, the reputation of the one who's died. I'm going to go ahead and read another translation just because you can't, you can't have just one on this one. And it's, it's just such a good verse. I'm going to read Larrington's translation as well, just because I, I, I think the, the emphasis and the, the, the poetry of it all is just, just so good. Cattle die. Kinsmen die. The self must also die. But the glory of reputation never dies. For the man who can get himself a good one. Cattle die. Kinsmen die. The self must also die. I know one thing which never dies. The reputation of each dead man. And in even others, and this is just off the top of my head, that final line is sometimes the doom of each dead man. We're going to get into what that word means, but... Oh man. Yeah, it's uh this is this is kind of what it's all about, I would say. Like this this is encapsulates that's kind of the purpose of the Havamal. Like what is it how do you live your life? Why are you living your life in this way? And what is your legacy going to be? Yeah, and, and you know the the thing here, I want to break down just a couple of things here. So in Crawford, it's it's cows, and in Larrington, it's cattle. It's the same thing. Cows, cattle was a shorthand for wealth, and it was a symbol of wealth. And and in a lot of cases, it was literally you had X number of cows, and that's how wealthy you were. But also, I mean, it it turned into a symbol of of wealth in general. And we can go back thousands of years to you know the the beginnings of the Indo-European people, and they were they were certainly like a nomadic people with with horses and things like that. Like this is this is pretty darn well known, but they would have also had had cattle. And you see today the reference the reverence for for cows in another Indo-European society, specifically Indo, the the people of India, the the Hindu people, they they revere cows and to the point where they don't even they don't kill them. Like they they went all the way to just milk and butter from cows is is the the sacred thing and and of course the the hindus did something else in terms of vegetarianism is actually a big thing over there and they they went in a different direction on that philosophically but still it's like cows are still revered as sacred over there and i mean so first of all wealth dies wealth falls away i mean that's uh, that's i think that it's not necessarily clear that that's always the case. I think there's an impression that, you know, if you accumulate wealth, you just get to keep it. But I mean, it, if you think about that, like, you know, you have to spend money to maintain your life. And, and you know, if you're, if you're bad with money, it, it can go away just like that. But then your family is also going to die and you're going to die yourself. So first of all, you know, start that off. It's like, it's very, very bleak. But then it turns it right around to how you live on, how you live on after your death. There isn't some talk of a mythical afterlife. And of course, we've, we've discussed some possibilities for the afterlife and, and Valhalla being the most famous one of them for, for warriors who die in battle. But for people who don't die in battle, there's, there's very little disgust. And I mean, for anyone, this is how you live on, right? 
it's very, it's actually very practical and it's interesting that it's, you know, these are words coming from Odin who, who is a God and has a hall for, you know, the, the glorious slain and as a psychopomp himself. So he's often ferrying people across, you know, from life to death. And there's no mention of, of this mythical spiritual afterlife. This is, it's very, the focus actually isn't really on, on death. It's on life and the life that will continue after, after you've died and, and gone. And, you know, the way that you're going to attain, attain a legacy and, and immortality in some ways. And, it's interesting because they, they talk about, you know, a good reputation for one who earns it well. And then the, the second one, they, they're, they don't necessarily talk about a, the good reputation. It's just that the reputation of the one who's died. So good or bad, that is what's going to live on after you. And that's, I actually like that they only talk about a good reputation because it's still, there's still that hope that, like everyone can get a good reputation before they die. And that's what's going to live on. That's what your children are going to raise monuments to and talk about, you know, to their children. And then their children will be, oh, our great grandfather or great grandmother did this and all that kind of stuff. So it, that's how you live on. And that's, I guess, genetically and in, in living memory, that's, that is how you're going to attain immortality and all that good stuff that, you know, we're striving for. And I guess, you know, Odin is assuming you're striving for if you're reading the Havamal. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing here is that how do you build a good reputation? The entire rest of the Havamal. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, a, it's a guide to it, right? Like that's, that's the entire thing is that all of these sayings, all of these nuggets of wisdom are really just pointing to how do you live your life in the best way possible that's going to result in you having a good reputation? How is it going to result in you leaving a good legacy? And I mean, okay, you don't have to follow this stuff as a monolith. Like, I would I would say absolutely. Like, if you disagree with something here, first of all, we, we would love to know about that and talk about that. But but it's also like make your own choices and make your own decisions. This is just you know this is only the the god of uh, at the head of the pantheon of of uh, of the Norse gods and the 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 one who has striven for knowledge and and experience and and gone for that all the time. That this that's only him talking. But you know you might know more. Um, but <laughs> really that 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 was a two sided way of saying like, you know, make your, make your own choices and, and live your own life. But, you know, be aware that whatever you do, this is going to, this is going to impact your legacy and your reputation no matter what. And I mean, these, these sayings, you might not necessarily agree with them all on all levels, but you, you know, it, I don't think there's been a single stanza here where I haven't taken something out of it and been like, huh, that has something good that I could apply to my life. And something good that I could apply to my life in a way that's going to result in leaving a good reputation. And and you know what? It, that's not to say that that is all there is. That's not to say that that's the only thing that should fulfill you in life. That's not to say that having a good reputation is the be all and end all. But what it's saying is that this is the one thing that's going to last no matter what. You know, there's another... Um, I'm definitely not going to try and recite this because I definitely couldn't. But there's a, there's a poem um, about a great king, and on the uh, it's on a monument to this great king about all the all the great things that he's got. Um, I am Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. And all that remains was the foot of this statue and the ruins of his great empire, that was all that was left. And, you know, that's that's a that's a poem that says something really similar, where it's like you can put up all the monuments you want, you can put up all of the, the things, you can self-proclaim your greatness, but at the end of the day, what's going to last? Like, all these things are going to eventually fall away. It's It's whether you have someone to remember you. It's whether you have someone telling your stories. It's whether you have left a good legacy in the world. And that I'll just, the, the word doom 
is used in the literal translation and uh, Ragnarok, the term Ragnarok essentially has that connotation of doom as well. I, I don't actually know if it's the same word in the original Old Norse. It might be, it might not be, but the word doom is used specifically here. And and they don't mean doom as in like the, the connotation that we have today where it's like a tragic ending to your life or something like that. It, it really just means like this is the final thing that is laid down in your life. And it's almost like the finishing touches on you as a person, what you are going to leave in the world. That's what doom is. It's like the, the final thing that caps off the entirety of your life. That's what happens when you die. That's your doom. And what are you going to leave? What is your doom going to be? What is the legacy you're going to leave? And yeah, I think... These two verses are the culmination of the entire poem. It's not done. The poem isn't done by a long shot. We have three more episodes to go. But this is like the culmination of the entire philosophy to me. And because it's like, no matter what, this is all that's going to be left. So. Absolutely. And I think it's really a a call to humility as well. Like it, it's, it's telling you, you know, everything, you're going to lose everything. Uh, your wealth is going to fade away. Your family is going to die and you are going to die the same way. And that it's set, it, it's setting you up so that you know exactly where you stand in the universe and the sort of the, the human condition in that, you know, everything that you Everything that you love, everyone that you love, and you yourself are all going to decay and fall away. And what's going to be left after it? And so it gets you in that. It gets you in that mindset. It gets you in that that spot where, where you're thinking, okay, what am I going to leave? And then you can look at the rest of the Havamal, and, and I think you you're open to the ideas that it's putting out, and saying, okay, well, if I do this, then you know I'll, I'll have friendship, and they'll be able to they'll remember me when I'm gone. And then, you know, they themselves will tell stories about me and I I will have had a good, strong family that, you know, with children and a wife that loves me or husband as the case may be kind of thing. Um, you know, like, and they're going to take care of me and then they'll see me off and often to the next world kind of thing, but they'll be there will raise a monument to me or, or sing songs about me, that kind of thing. It it's, it just really captures everything that the Havamal and the sayings of the high, the high one is trying to trying to be and trying to get you to understand about life. It, it's a pretty incredible and powerful uh, set of stanzas. It's probably why these two are the most famous. And, you know, even people with just uh, cursory knowledge of Norse mythology have usually heard this and can be like, oh, yeah, that's from Norse mythology, you know. So it just it, it sort of it really captures the human, the human experience and the desire to, to live on after you're, you're dead. Well, yeah. And I mean, that's the whole other side to it too. It's like a lot of religions seem preoccupied with death, with where you're going to go in the next life. I certainly, in, in my experience, and, and I don't know if, if we've gone into too much detail on, on, um, on our backgrounds, but, but I used to be a Christian and, 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 there, there seemed to be a preoccupation with it where it was like, it was all about getting to that next life and just doing all the good things to get to that next life. And it's all about where you're going to end up and where you're going to live in the next life sort of thing. Like, and, and now it's like, to me in a lot of ways, that was like, what, well, what's the, what's the meaning now? What does that give meaning for myself now? Right. And I mean, I, I think, first of all, this is leaving open the possibility that there could be some kind of afterlife that we just don't know about. And, and end of the day, you, you know, I, I don't think we know exactly what is real, what what might happen at the end of your life, right? I, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. I, I think, I do not think anyone actually knows what's going to happen to them after they die. But I believe this is right. You know, it's it's like... 
it's saying you need to live your life in a good way and you need to, and, and I mean, look at all, look at all these stanzas that say, enjoy life. Like what kind of reputation are you going to give off if you don't enjoy life? Like, I don't think you're going to be a joyful person. I don't think you're going to be a good friend. I don't think you're going to be a, a loving parent uh, or a, or a loving partner to your spouse, right? Like if you don't enjoy life. The, the sum of, of all of these things, all of these stanzas, it, it might seem a little bit disjointed sometimes. So, sometimes you'll get a run of three or four or five stanzas that all go on the same theme. But I think that the point is that there's so many facets of life that you had to take into consideration. And, and I mean, I, I don't mean to imply at all when I'm when we're, when we're looking at, at this poem here, it's like this isn't the only source of, of wisdom. There are so many other books and so many other people who have who have done a lot of good things and have have thought through hard problems about how to live in the world and i mean go and then listen to that and 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 read and and try and get something out of that too but you know if if you want to start here this is a great place to start and then you look at these two stanzas and and it's like if you live your life in the best way you possibly can and you actually work hard to give to leave a good legacy leave your doom make your doom something good if you make that the focus of your life if you make that the thing that you aim for i don't see how you you have a a bad go of it you know no exactly i i don't think there's much more i could add to that so yeah it's uh it's a great couple of verses and, and just really uh it kind of tells you everything you need to know about uh, the Norse ethos. And and I would say, like, you know, European paganism as well, although, like, uh, Roman paganism and Greek paganism, I had probably even Egyptian, they also had this uh, emphasis on living a good life and a, and a legacy and enjoying life. And, yeah, it's a very, uh, a very pagan thought process that, seems to it seems to have changed a lot as sort of the the monotheisms spread throughout the west so yeah it's just a, it's a we could probably do a whole three hour episode just on these two verses but instead of that we should probably move on yeah 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 okay <laughs> verse 78 back to the poem I saw big herds of cattle owned by a rich man's sons. Now they carry a beggar's staff. Wealth is like the twinkling of an eye. No friend could be more faithless. So I really like this one, and I think it ties directly into the last two groups of stanzas we've been talking about, first of all. So it's it's a continuation of in 76 and 77 where it says, you know, cattle die yeah wealth wealth dies wealth falls away right wealth is fleeting but it also ties back into you know the the idea of you know neither the rich man or the poor man should blame each other for their situation because really it turns this is a description of how the wealthy don't always stay wealthy or you know just because you manage to have some success it doesn't it doesn't guarantee continued success and uh isn't isn't the the statistic something like most fortunes only last three generations because you have like the first one that that works really hard they didn't really have very much and they and their kids probably as well like kind of see that they see the hard working the work ethic but then by the third generation it's the ones that grew up in money and and didn't know the value of the hard work it took to get it and and they're the ones that squander it a lot of the time not not always but and then fortune 500 companies are the same way as well like it takes there's a certain kind of cycle and a lot of them will drop off after a certain amount of time because they've they they no longer innovate and they no longer do what they need to succeed and and i think that's um you know it's just like you're not always going to have wealth and so first of all you should you should enjoy it while you have it but also like just because you're not wealthy now doesn't mean you can't become wealthy by by working hard and you know the there's always going to be people leaving a void there because they they don't uh they don't handle their money responsibly right so for sure and 
I think it's a good, I think this verse is good because it, you can extrapolate it to have it work on several levels. So this is, as you're saying, the, the family that within three generations, it's sort of the, the cutoff and it, it's sort of the, it's kind of like the filter where if, if a family is going to be like a dynasty, they're, if they make it past the third generation, then they've, they've pretty much got it made. Like they've been able to figure out how to instill that, uh, hard work and innovation into sort of the family, uh, work ethic and it's going to keep going. But it's companies too, I'm sure after that, like there are companies that have been around for, you know, centuries even. And they're able to do that because they've sort of figured out a way to keep to keep themselves uh, in the game and fighting for dominance. But you can also see that, like, if you take that higher, you can see that in uh, sort of the life and death of uh, civilizations as well. And th- that's one of the reasons why I think there's a lot of truth in this and that uh, you often, uh, I think, I first heard this on uh, Hardcore History with Dan Carlin. I think it was uh, about uh, the Persian Empire, one of his great episodes, that you uh, you walk up the s- stairs to, I guess, greatness in your bare feet and walk down the stairs in satin slippers. And it's just the idea that you have to, you have to be hard and tough and, you know, scrappy to make your way up, but when when that conflict and the hardship is gone how do you maintain that that willingness to fight and most of the time you don't and so that's your downfall is that you you slowly decay and uh things start to uh so entropy is one of the uh, laws of the universe yeah entropy everything just sort of it starts to decay and fall away and so and then it starts again it's it's a cycle but, uh, but yeah, so it's, a, I just, I think there's a lot of truth in, in the stanza that it, uh, because it works on all those different levels that if you can, usually when you can see that something about it is pretty true. Absolutely. And, and I mean, I, I think if we're, if we're taking this to be like kind of a, of a warning or something like that, it's almost like to instill values in your children, no matter, no matter whether you, you have worked hard and given them a, a good life sort of thing, but also like to to show them and to illustrate how it's like, it's not always guaranteed, right? Like, um, part of the, the issue with the downfall is something like, you know, you give your kids everything because you didn't really have a whole lot, but then you also see CEOs, right? Some, I think Bill Gates does this where it's like, yeah, he's, he's giving his kids like some money to be comfortable with and everything like that, but he's going to give the vast majority of his fortune away over the course of his, of his lifetime. And I think the, the rest of his money is supposed to be like tied up in some kind of trust or something like that, that eventually, you know, makes a whole bunch of charities and stuff. And like, that's because like he, he wants his children to also be, be successful in their own right. Like it not, it's not just because like, you know, you, you have some children they're like, of course he's going to, he's going to make sure that they don't have nothing, but it's also like, you're not getting $80 billion though. Right. So it's, it's, it's just something like, I I think a lot of successful people have the right idea with their children and a lot have the wrong idea with their children where it's like they, the, you have to instill the right set of values in order to kind of keep the cycle going. And that's, that's a goal. I think that's, that's something that you can do practically to give your children the, the tools to continue succeeding, even if you are already kind of near that top, because I mean, the, barring a few people there's there's nowhere to go but up in a lot of cases like you you can always keep going you can, you can always keep climbing the hierarchy right it's there's very few people that are at the top you know definitely the very top no absolutely and there's there is usually room to grow i'm just thinking of other celebrities that aren't uh like uh, that aren't going to sort of or going to try and prevent their their children from falling in that trap. I I seem to recall a uh, famous chef and really good like person who's really good at swearing. Gordon Ramsay is uh, he's not going to give his kids much money because he wants them to be to have that hunger that he has, which is pro- like probably going to get them if he's able to instill that hunger. 
uh, probably actually get them more money than he would be able to uh, give them. And then like other celebrities that you wouldn't necessarily think. And I mean, I don't know. I try to stay out of a lot of celebrity stuff because like why bother? It's a waste of brain space. But um, Paris Hilton is actually a good example of a kid who got money, but improved upon it because her, uh, her, her family, of course, is the, the Hilton empire of hotels and that kind of thing. But her various endeavors have uh, vastly increased her own fortune. So shockingly, she's actually like pretty, uh, pretty astute at staying hungry and making sure that she isn't just uh, resting on the, uh, the money of her family, but she's actively contributing to it. So I thought that was interesting. You wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily expect that. No, absolutely. But it's, it's, it's interesting to hear about that. And it's also a, a nice real life example of kind of, kind of this very thing. Like the, the stanza itself is, is certainly saying that wealth is fleeting and it's not necessarily going to last, but it's also, I think by having that negative, it implies, okay, here's, here's how you can do that through a positive, right? So. Exactly. Actually, we'll, we'll see some more of that in the next verse as well. Are you uh, good to move on? I'm good. Let's do it. Verse 79. If an unwise man chances upon money or a woman's love, he will grow more arrogant, but not more intelligent. He will be deceived about his own worth. I think this says something like you don't always get what you deserve, positive or negative. It's certainly a commentary on how life is not necessarily fair because, I mean, you know, if you if you see someone succeeding who you don't think has earned it or deserves it or something like that, it's entirely possible, first of all, that they actually did put in the work and things like that and have earned it. But it's also entirely possible that they did not earn it and they just, you know, got very lucky or, or something like that, had the right connections. That's that's the sort of thing that makes people very, very cynical, I think, in the world where it's like where they maybe see that a couple of times and like, oh, that's the only way you get ahead in the world. Right. But, you know, I, I would still say that those people in general, like they did not actually deserve that. That's the system. Um, the system is often unfair. The system nature is often unfair in a negative sense, but it's also neg it's also unfair in a positive sense as well Absolutely. for some people. So, I mean, I, I think that's just a byproduct of how the world works, how nature works. And then I, I think it's also a, a case of like, always be humble, no matter how much success you have, right? We keep on coming back to that, how humility is, is huge, where it's like, no matter how much success you have, don't become arrogant. Don't, don't think more of yourself than you should. And, and, uh, be, because, you know, maybe it turns out that you didn't deserve it, but you know, I, I would say you, even if you, you get somewhere w without making the right sacrifices, without having earned something, you, you know, if you at least recognize that, oh man, like I, I didn't necessarily earn this, right? But maybe now I can live my life in a good way. I think this stanza is saying that that's always, not always the case, you know, they won't, uh, they will grow more arrogant, right? Like that's, that's more likely to happen, you know, if, if you don't earn what you, um, what you receive in life. Right. Definitely. And I, I think it's actually, kind of, it is kind of an answer to the last stanza where, you know, if you want to, if you want to make wealth a, a more faithful friend, you know, humility is the is sort of the key. And even with humility, that's not a guarantee that the wealth will stay because, you know, you could have gotten lucky, but it might, and, you know, there are things that happen that outside of your control and that might just, you know, uh, wash up, like wash away one day. It just happens. But you can kind of prevent it or at least guard against it by not being arrogant and not thinking that you're more intelligent than you are because you've, you've ach achieved this greatness through no fault of your own. And it's one of those things like I, I know for myself, I try not to look uh, a gift horse in the mouth like that old saying, like I, if if something good has happened to me, I don't necessarily think it's because I've done it. It's it's like, oh, you know what? This was a this was a good spot of luck. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to finagle with it. I'm not going to I, I'm, I'm going to respect it for what it is and 
move on with this bit of luck that's helped me along the way because you know it could be gone tomorrow i didn't necessarily cause it to happen it's really awesome that it did happen so i'm going to make the best of it but and you know the flip side of that is also like you know a lot of things random things happen in the world all the time and and you, and you know you may maybe you chalk that up to luck but also there's a case of i think if you if you are aiming in the right direction sort of thing though you're aiming your life in a, in a way that's going to create good things for yourself you know, you know maybe that luck kind of multiplies and maybe you have the right attitude about it too where it's like this wasn't necessarily just me I'm not going to to waste this you know that's that's the right attitude to have like I think they're talking about again here it's the negative here's the wrong attitude like here for sure you're going to grow more ele- arrogant but not more intelligent right like that's I think that's the the negative side and and the positive is implied and the positive being like you you work hard for what you have and I mean even even if you you have some unfairness that swings into your favor some positive luck like you you deal with it in a good way and not not the way that gets you more arrogant or more uh, full of yourself, right? Like you don't want your ego to to kind of get too big, right? Because that's just going to set you up for failure. Definitely. And I'm just thinking you can see this in, uh, in sports a lot where the team, you can, you know, whether the team complains about like a bad call from the ref or says, well, you know what, we've had bad calls go our way, so it's part of the game and, you know, we learn from it and move on kind of thing. And that, that, that's sort of the right attitude that good or bad, you know, you sort of take it, you take it for what it is. It's a, a thing that you didn't really have control over, but you're making the best of it and then, and then move on with that so that you're not, uh, again, and also to not becoming dependent on good luck like that. Or or bad luck for that matter, but no, it's a it's an interesting it's interesting one because it takes the negative, like you know, don't do this because this is stupid kind of thing. But there's there's a lot to be learned from the positive uh, part of it as well. Agreed, a good one, another good one. I feel like we're we're getting a lot of good ones in this uh, in this one. Like, not that there weren't good ones in the other ones, but like. This one's just like hit after hit. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and you know, it, this, it, in a lot of ways, this feels like the the payoff. You know, like the the rest of the poem has kind of built up a whole lot of these building blocks, and now it's now it's kind of getting to like here is the the really the really deep stuff that ties it all together, and and we are actually uh, getting to the end of a of a section. It's uh, um, I, I believe eighty one is the traditional end of of this particular section. We're gonna go a bit past it because I, th- I think we decided it made sense to go all the way to eighty three today, but. But uh, 81, I think, is the traditional end of this section, which is all the the wisdom of the, like the, the main portion of, of wisdom. And, and that's not to say that the rest of the Havamal is not going to be a whole bunch of still good, useful, wise things. But it's not um, it's not all in the same context where it's just like here is this wisdom. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's it's got a little more contextualization or something. So we're, and my point is we're at the end of a of an actual section here and possibly the end of a uh, of an original poem, like yes, possibly at the end of that. And so I think that's maybe part of why this is like, Oh man, we're getting to some really deep, good stuff. Right. So definitely. And you can see too, that we had to get through sort of the, I would say maybe the more obvious things like, you know, don't be drunk and an idiot. Well, it, like if you're having a hard time with that, you're not going to get to the part where, you're going to be able to live a good life with a good reputation so that when your wealth goes and your family dies and all that kind of stuff, um, you're going to have that reputation that can be remembered. All right. So verse 80, back to the poem. What you ask of the runes will prove true. They are gifts of the Aesir made by the gods and painted by Odin. You will learn best with your mouth shut. The idea of the runes is is something that underpins Norse mythology, and and I think it's right that they're they're guard, regarded with an air of kind of mysticism and mystery because they mean secret. The word rune essentially translates to secret. Is that that's right? Right. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, the I think what what we're getting at here is like 
what you ask of the runes. So the, the runes, I think, are really something that is the distillation of wisdom over time. It's like the distillation of these broad, broad concepts, broad wisdoms into something that, that can be symbolized with a, a physical symbol. And in a lot of cases, the runes are, are like a physical symbol sort of thing, but they, they're also a word and they also stand for a concept. And it's, and, uh, I, I think that's what this stanza is saying is like the distilled wisdom of the culture will prove itself true. I think that is correct. Like the, the things that have remained true over the course of time are true for a reason. Like we have not learned these things over thousands of years and remembered them over thousands of years because they are somehow temporary or on a whim. They are like permanent truths that are, that are as real as anything can be. And I think this is almost pointing to like, if you, if you ignore that, if you ignore these truths that have been discovered and distilled and remembered over thousands of years, you're ignoring so much great wisdom and learning best with your mouth shut. I think that's like, yeah, sit and learn and listen and appreciate the lessons that have come before you because these are, these are lessons that take thousands of years to develop and to, to really come into their own and for us to understand them properly. You're not going to do that on your own. I think that's what this is saying. That is almost literally exactly the notes I have for that. That's exactly where I went with it. Um, the only tidbits I'll add are, is that I've heard the runes described kind of as like the uh, periodic table of elements. And so it's sort of what, what the universe and life is created by. And I, I think we, we've seen that and, and you've explained that perfectly well. And that, you know, that they're gifts of the Aesir made by the gods and painted by Odin. It's, it, it really shows to me that it's, these lessons are learned from from the archetypes and the concepts that, that we have seen and like we can't emphasize enough how hard won these lessons are because every lesson was learned because someone died not doing it and so and so then someone saw that and said okay well do it this way but maybe they died too. And it was like, okay, well, what about this? And it, they sort of narrowed it down because otherwise they kept narrowing it down by how well it worked. So eventually what you're getting is this truly distilled wisdom is this is the best lessons for life that we have learned. And if you live with these lessons, you are going to have a good life and you might even be able to distill it more and get even better results from it. But here's what we have so far. And when you deviate from this, this is when bad things happen. So don't deviate from it because you're going to die. And, and I, I don't even say like die facetiously or for emphasis. It's quite literally, especially back then, like the line between life and death was pretty slim. Like, you like freezing to death in your own home was not like a weird thing to happen. It happened. It still happens today. Yeah. The, a lot of elderly, like in a, oh, for sure. a massive snowstorm and they're not prepared for it happens. Yeah. So it, there, there is a real mortal danger there. And it's kind of funny to think, cause I don't, I don't think we have it as a culture really anymore, but you know, there was a sort of understood, feeling idea and purpose that the point was to continue the species on and they might not have even thought of themselves as a species but just you continue the tribe right so that's why you would have that's why you would share your wisdom and so that you know maybe this time more kids would survive and all that kind of stuff and i think we've lost the idea and in a lot of cases uh, there's a lot of open hostility to the idea of of sort of Western civilization continuing. And, and one of the ways that we're seeing that is that how, like how many people are we seeing who, who aren't listening to the wisdom and rather they're, they're talking about how it should be. Well, 
the wisdom that was gained was, okay, this is kind of how the world works. And the world doesn't care about how we think it should work at all. It, it's, it's going to be itself. It's going to do what it does. And it, it's entirely up to us to conform to it. Because if, And again, if we don't, the price is you die. That's like it, it, it is as simple as that. And I just think of all the, uh, all the kids in university. And I mean, I, I went to university and I, I may have been guilty of this myself, but like, oh, if the world worked like this, it'd be so much better. It's like, well, the world doesn't care. The universe doesn't care. It, it, it works the way it does. And the quicker you learn that and then try to adapt and conform to, to it, the better, better off you are because then you can, then you can tweak like, Oh, if we behave in this way, it works out pretty well. But if we just change a little bit, Oh, it's way better, but you have to, you have to learn the ins and outs first. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the, the ins and outs are what have survived through these generations, these millennia, right? And that, and that is the distillation that I think is the concept of the runes here. It is the, the wisdom that has been proven true over time. And this is what you can at least base your life on. You, this is what you can at least base society on because this is how it actually works. And I mean, like I'm not very far out of university and I'm, I'm not very far. I'm not much older than like these, these kids who, you know, are in their first year of university railing against capitalism and, and Christianity and Judeo Christian culture and society. But it's like, you know, what, what do they know? And then, I mean, a valid point is what do I know? But I, and not to toot my own horn here or anything like that, but I, I think the, the thing that I'm most proud of in, in this whole process has been trying to just get to know this, this old, old wisdom. And, and I mean, I think it bears repeating our, our caveat. We are not experts. I am absolutely not an expert in any of this, but I want to know more. I want to learn. I want to learn these secrets. I want to learn the runes. I want to learn the way the world works because, you know, maybe then I can make that little contribution that, uh, that might uh, refine our understanding of the world, you know, and I, and uh, I do not want to be the one that screams, oh, we have to change it all and tear it all down without having learned about it first. And I, and I think through the course of learning about it, you can't tear it all down. No, exactly. And I mean, in some ways, this podcast is exactly, I mean, we are talking about it, but it's only because we're talking about what we've listened to and trying to work it out and trying to figure out what does it actually mean. We're This whole thing is essentially about learning the rules of the game inside and out before you decide to change the game. Yeah. That, so, yeah, I like that verse a lot. Oh, yeah. And it honestly gives me some... Uh a, a new perspective on on what the idea of the runes actually are and 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 I think it I'm starting to get that it's it's something like this this wisdom that has been distilled over time and yeah it's pretty cool we're going to revisit the runes uh it'll be the last episode of the Hava Mall that will mostly focus on the runes so that should be a fun one that should be a fun one all right moving on verse 81 back to the poem don't praise the day until it's night. Don't praise your wife until she's buried. Don't praise the sword till after the fight, nor your daughter till she's married. Don't praise the ice until it's crossed, nor the ale until you're sloshed. Isn't that just a, the most absurd and harsh and ridiculous verse you've ever heard, huh? All in one. <laughs> you no, know, it's so good, but... It's so harsh. Don't praise your wife until she's dead. Like, oh my goodness. It's like, because I mean, I, lo I love my wife, but if, if this is saying like, huh, well, d d don't, uh, don't make any judgment on, <laughs> on her. <laughs> well, but, but it's, it's saying exactly what we talked about in 76 and 77, though. It's like, that's your legacy. And I, I'm, I think it talks about the, the perspective here. This is Odin. This is, you know, he's, he is a male God. He is a man. And I, and I think the the tone of the conversation is he's talking to other men, whether whether you think that's fair or not. But you, you know, so the perspective is your your wife, your daughter. So it's like 
the things that you aren't, something like that, what's not you, but the closest relationships you're going to have, whatever. But, uh, you, you know, it, this is, this is saying this is equal opportunity. Uh, don't, uh, don't close the book on your legacy until you're actually done sort of thing. An equal opportunity too. It shouldn't just apply to the, to the men. It should apply to the, to the ladies as well. And, and, uh, you know, don't praise the ale until you're sloshed. Like, and it's funny, but it's also like, what's the purpose of the, the ale to get you drunk apparently. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, if it's not very good, uh, it's not going to get you drunk, I guess. So for sure. And I wonder if, I, I would imagine there's a little bit of poetic license that uh, Crawford used for the word sloshed because it just, one, it fits really well at the end. Like I, I love his word choice there because uh, he probably could have been inebriated or drunk or whatever, but sloshed is, is a good one. Um, yeah. It's kind of like, don't count your chickens until they're hatched. And there's just, then they, Odin kind of goes through the different types of chickens that you could have. <laughs> um, and, and it is harsh. I mean, we all, I think, have an ideal of our spouse and our, you know, if you've got kids, I'm sure you're, you think they're pretty great. And, and I like the idea of like, you know, don't praise your sword till the fight's over, all that kind of stuff. It, it really is just don't, uh, don't judge something until it's done what it's supposed to do. Yeah, and, and and I mean, I do want to make a point here. The 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 one about the daughter and all that. Uh, don't praise your daughter until she's married. And I think it's actually like um, uh, in in Larrington. I'll just draw like a little comparison here. It's it's that the woman when she is cremated, like it. Uh, at eve okay i'll just do the whole thing for sure absolutely. at evening should the day be praised the woman when she is cremated the blade when it is tested the girl when she is married the ice when it is crossed the ale when it is drunk so i think crawford um clarifies what this is what this is saying but it, it's a little more generic i i think here in larrington where it's where it's a little more like the, the woman in general and so it's like people in general, I think is more just to extend that all the way. And like, you know, the, the girl until she's married like that, that was certainly a societal thing where it's like, you, you know, the, the end goal of, of being a child is to eventually get out into the world and become a good functioning adult sort of thing. And getting married is a big part of that. And so I don't want to put a, a whole big spin on this where it's like the only purpose of women is getting married and making babies and stuff like that. But a lot of women want to get married and make babies. So like, you know, that's, that's just good for them if that's what they want to do sort of thing. For sure. It was certainly a societal thing because that's how you're going to survive too. So that's, that's just a, a concept of the, the values there where it's, it's just a good thing to encourage people to get married as a society. So. Absolutely. Good. In a society, there's, that's the only way you get more, um, more citizens, right? Is for there to be uh, children born in wedlock. Otherwise, they're not. They're. I mean, the correct term back then would be bastard. And I know, like in ancient Greece, uh, bastards are illegitimate children. They couldn't become citizens. Meaning, they couldn't vote. They couldn't partake in society. So, like, it was a big deal to make sure that your kids were born in wedlock. Yeah, that was, I suppose, a way of them enforcing that. And I mean, we certainly had that through like like Christianity in general, sure. like at the very least frowned on having kids outside of wedlock. And the I think the functional effect, if you, if you don't have that, it's a lot of single mothers. It's not very many single fathers because the men just go away sort of thing. And, and, and that's, ex I was just going to bring that up actually, is the idea of illegitimate children and like, even uh, the tradition of the women taking the man's last name, all of that was actually to keep the man around because the men are the ones who are going to leave. Like this actually doesn't shed good light on men at all it, be, <laughs> because they're the ones who leave. The, the women can't leave the baby when they're pregnant. Like it, they're pretty stuck, but men, I mean, there's no, well, I don't want to say there's no, because you know, I've heard from friends who've had their babies and like, it's, they have a super strong bond and they're super good fathers, all that kind of stuff. But there isn't that like actual biological necessity for them to stick around. So it's a, it's a way of, um, 
kind of shaming them to stick around. And I, I think kind of got off track here, but it's sort of this idea that marriage was actually a way to keep men around and to, and to, to bound them or bind them to, to the women that they were marrying. Yeah. I think the idea is something like if a man is successful enough to get one woman, he's successful enough to get two or three or more or more than that. And so why why not, why not give that a shot sort of thing for, for the guys. And then the flip side of that as well is like, if you're not successful enough to get any women, if, if it's just a free for all there, then, uh, well, you're just going to be frustrated and eventually get resentful and violent. And then by, sort of enforcing this one one man one woman thing as society like not not as like any any conspiracy sort of thing certainly not any kind of government or or even religion being like it has to be this way sort of thing just society in general saying huh this might be a better way forward and then you know traditions start building up very organically then it turns into you know the the super successful men who might have dozens of women possibly you know they they eventually only have one for the most part and then you you know that that takes the competition for um men kind of out of the equation and and a lot of more men start to become more successful over time and it, it it's just good for it's good for everyone sort of thing for sure yeah and i know like uh polygamy and that kind of thing uh in general is terrible for women in the society because uh well, you know, not surprisingly, it takes a lot of effort to raise children. And it's you like having, it is like a two adult job. And, you know, just having a mom who's doing it all alone while there's a father who has spread himself so thin amongst all the women. That's not like, that's not good for anyone. So no, it's a, uh, it's an, when you dig into it, it's interesting to see how much I think in some circles, and I, I don't think this is a prevalent belief by any means, but there is a belief that marriage isn't, is, uh, is a way to keep women down and shackled kind of thing, but really it's to keep them <laughs> not shackled and down because, you know, they'll have the man that, you know, got them pregnant around to take care of them and, and contribute to the household as he should. So Exactly. The, the, the connotation here, I think is really more like monogamy paired up monogamy marriage between two people is like, is just the, the system of organizing society that has worked best over time. And, you know, we have a lot of social upheaval. There's, there's uh, lots of statistics about single parenthood and things like that. And it's growing. Like the number of single mothers out there is, is, is huge. Single parents in general, it's huge. And I don't know, like, would you necessarily say that we're getting it right right now? I, like, I mean, uh, for all the social progress we're making, maybe we're taking some steps backward by de-emphasizing the, uh, the importance of, of marriage if you plan to have kids, something for like sure. that. And again, that's not to say that single parents can't do a great job. It's just a lot harder. And uh, similar, like, if you... Uh, growing up without like a father, for example, there, there's a greater chance that you will have run-ins with the law, but it's not like a, it's not a sentence. It doesn't mean you have to, like there are lots of people who grew up with, without a father who, you know, are fine upstanding citizens kind of thing. And it's one of those situations where like, if you look at uh, the prison population, it's like virtually everyone in there didn't have a father, but not everyone who doesn't have a father goes to jail. So that's sort of how that breaks down. But yeah, it, it sort of, we've sort of figured out this system of organization for society to function. And it's sort of the best we have right now. I mean, maybe we can tweak it somehow, but it, it seems to have been working. So just to tie us back in here, because we definitely went on a huge tangent there. That was really all to say, I think uh, this isn't all putting the onus on getting married on, on the young ladies of the world. It's, it's, it's a, it's a two-sided thing and it definitely takes two kind of deal. But the, the point that I think we're making here is definitely that it's not this uh, overbearing patriarchal construction to keep women down and that's not what's implied in this stanza either. It's it's something that has worked out to be the, the best system of maintaining stable societies over time. Yes. That's actually a great way of summing it up.
And then the rest of it was don't count your chickens until they hatch. I think we, yeah. I think we can agree on that. For sure. All right. Uh, verse 82. Back to the poem. Chop wood when the wind blows. Row your boat on the sea. Court a lover at nighttime, for the day has many eyes. Value a ship for its speed, a shield for its protection, a sword for its sharpness, and a woman for her kiss. So this is interesting. This 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 almost gets starts into something that's very almost a little flowery. The language it, it it's a little more actually poetic, I think, in terms of the the, the language here. And and I think it's it's sort of I think it's sort of saying like uh, enjoy life when it's appropriate to or something like that. Like like get the most out of life. It's another one of those enjoy life kind of stanzas and like get value and enjoyment out of the world for the for the ways that it's best like value a, a ship for its speed a shield for its protection a sword for its sharpness i think the flip side is don't value a shield for its sharpness or its speed like a shield is a shield here's here's the thing here is the tool uh, an, an idea of jordan peterson's not just of him but but that he he likes is that uh we don't actually see things we see tools or obstacles and you know we see the ability of something to improve our lives as a tool or to hinder our lives as an obstacle and so that's that's a, like a a psychological idea that I definitely don't know uh, nearly as much about as Dr. Peterson. So uh, go read his book, Maps of Meaning, if, uh, if you want to know more about that. But, uh, you know, val- value a ship for its speed, a shield for its protection, a sword for its sharpness. I think it's that's, some, that's saying something like value a tool for what it's useful for. Exactly. Yeah, I, that's what I got from it was that value a tool for what it's useful for. So it's like... Um, it made me think of like when people don't like an action movie because there's too much violence or something. And it's like, well, that or like a Quentin Tarantino movie saying it's too violent. And you're like, you went to see a Quentin Tarantino movie. Like this is, this is what it's for. Like you, the, you know what you're getting. And, uh, and it's the same with this, you know, like why would you value a sword for, you know, its ability to stir, or like churn butter or something like it doesn't make any sense. And you could, you could complain about how terrible it is for churning butter, but you're not using it for the right thing. So what's the point? Uh, and so every, everything has its purpose. And I think also uh, everything has a time that, you know, a, a time and place for it. I'm curious about chopping wood when the wind blows. I don't know why that would be a thing. So if anyone knows why, uh, please feel free to let us know. Cause I'm very curious to, to know that, but like the rest are pretty obvious, but chopping, uh, chopping wood when the wind blows is agreed. I, I don't have much on that one. Yeah. And, and I, I think I just want to point out what, what the, what Larrington's translation is for this. I think you're going to find it funny. Just the end of it. Use a ship to glide along a shield for defense, a sword for blows and a girl for kisses. That is funny. <laughs> and I mean, that's really, I, I really do not want to imply here anything to the, to the extent of like women are for kisses or for, or for sex or for babies or anything like that. But if you're a man who is not with a woman. If you're a man who's not in a, a relationship sort of thing, you want to get a kiss, man. Like, yeah, like you, I know what it's like to be 16 and to just <laughs> to just really get a girlfriend and things like that. Like that's that's this. Come on, it's it's nothing more sinister than that. No, and, and you, I mean, you really want to be careful. Like, if you're kissing your sword, you might cut your lip. So there we go. <laughs> like, you're not again. You're you, everything has a time and a place and. Kissing your sword is not the right use of your sword. Just like, you know, using your woman to kill someone, probably not the right use of your woman. There we go. So there we go. Do you think the that we were joking came across? I'm, I hope so. Yeah. We're, we're, we're joking, guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then for the uh, the final stanza of the day. Number 83, back to the poem, drink ale by the fire, skate on ice, buy a thin horse and a rusty sword, 
Give your horse food and let your dog feed itself. So this one was interesting. I think it's a continuance of the same of the previous stanza. Drink ale by the fire, skate on the ice, do things in their right moment and with their right purpose. But then buy a thin horse and a rusty sword. The implication there, I think, is like you can give your thin horse some food and improve it. You can take your rusty sword and if you know what to do with it, you can make a better sword out of it. So I think that I think that's it's something some combination of here's how you can be a little more frugal with with your resources because you can put in the time and the effort to improve it and also kind of a sense of like you don't necessarily have to go overboard and always have the best which is kind of ironic in the in the sense that you know the best is kind of the the target in a lot of cases but you, you know even earlier today we heard something like don't be ashamed if you don't have the best things, but get some things like, you, you know, what I mean, that's like the gist of, um, you, you know, don't be, don't beat yourself up if you don't, if you don't have the best, but like, you know, still try and do the best with what you have sort of thing. Like, I think this is something kind of similar to that. Definitely. I think it's a, it is a saying, you know, do things in a proper time, uh, a lot of these things are actually pretty, uh, pretty fun, like drinking ale by the fire and skating on ice. Um, but then, like buying a thin horse, well, you, you're you're able, yeah, you're exactly right. You're able to feed the horse on your own, so you you don't have to spend money on it. You just spend some time and effort, and really time and effort that you're going to spend on your horse anyway. So, and then with with uh, your dog, your dog can. We don't see it too much nowadays, but I would imagine in, in village life, your dog would go off and hunt on its own and find its own food and that kind of thing. So it wasn't, uh, I, and just, just think of the life then, like there wasn't the fear of it, like getting hit by a car or something like that. And it would, you know, I imagine they were a little less domesticated back then too. Yeah, quite possibly. So and, and you know, I, I think that I think what that's getting at is know what you need to put your resources into because, you know, your your time and your effort is is a scarce resource. And if you know what you need to put time and money and resources into, then I think that might go better for you. Absolutely, yeah. I I think that's exactly what it's uh, what it's getting at. I, I don't really have anything too much to add for that one. No, that's uh, that's it for me. This has been uh, been a good one. It has been, and I mean, next time we get into the Havmal, we're gonna sort of dive right in. So it's sort of a a good spot to rest before we get into the like some other uh, big serious stuff. Some serious stuff. Some really cool stories. Definitely uh, stay with us for the the next few episodes. We got three more planned for the Havamal. So and. Uh, Maybe just at an attempt at a at a recap on this guy. I mean, we just had the, some of the most serious, deep, deep verses in in the whole of this poem here, seventy six and seventy seven being some of the biggest. But also, like many of the ones around them, were just so drenched in 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 wisdom and in, and in how the world works and in how life is and how to live in the world. It's it was a really really good. Really, really good verse, uh, really good set of verses, and really optimistic too. This episode, this was, I'm, I'm feeling good after this. So, yeah, because you know, whenever we, we're talking about like Ragnarok or Balder, it's kind of a downer, but uh, or more specifically, the death of Balder. But there have been like some pretty dark episodes where it's been a downer. This one's been pretty awesome. It has been a good episode, and I just want to uh, give a little teaser out for our next episode. We've uh, we've had many requests from uh, from people to maybe take uh, take the show in a different direction, and we're not we're not doing that exclusively. But we are going to be covering Kalevala with our next episode. So we're going to be doing our first in the series of the Kalevala in our next episode, and, and we're not going to to do it uh, every time. It's not like we're switching off of the Poetic Edda, but we're, we're going to work it in. And our focus is still on um, getting through the Poetic Edda because that was our original intention for what we wanted to cover. But the Kalevala has some really cool stories. And so we're definitely going to do that. Uh, I, I would guess every third or fourth episode or something like that, we'll try and make that one uh, on the Kalevala. So. Definitely. I mean, it fits right in with you know the myths and legends of Northern Europe. So 
Yeah, it's perfect. Exactly. We're diversifying a little. It's not just uh, Norse mythology now. It'll be Norse and Finnish mythology. So that's uh, that's pretty exciting. So definitely tune in for that. For sure. And then I think that's uh, that's about it other than the, uh, the regular gratitudes and thanks. And so, uh, again, we've been looking at uh, the Poetic Edda, translated by Jackson Crawford and published by Hackett Publishing. So uh, a big thanks to them, and you can check out uh, his YouTube page, and uh, we've got a link to Amazon for the book. We should probably thank uh, Jocko Willink for uh, you know the notes we were able to make based off of his show. So uh, thanks, Jocko Willink, and remember to get after it. Get after it. Discipline equals freedom. His, uh, we'll have a link to his uh, YouTube channel and probably podcast uh, in the description. Um, what else? Oh, Dr. Jordan Peterson. Can't forget him. Nope. Uh, again, his, uh, lectures on, on the Bible and his various classes on YouTube. That's sort of the, uh, not sort of, it is the direct inspiration for this. So, uh, thanks to him and his work. And, uh, we've got links to his stuff as well. And aside from that, uh, you can, oh, you can follow us on, social media and please if you're uh, if you like what you're hearing uh give us a review on itunes and you know subscribe on youtube and subscribe on the podcast uh, provider of your choice i think we're on pretty much all of them except spotify we're on the waiting list for spotify they've got a they've got a funky thing going on there they're doing some server upgrades apparently is oh. what is what we were told so it's it's okay we'll we'll get on there eventually but we're on all the other major providers right now yeah and uh Facebook, Northern Myths Podcast, uh, Instagram, Northern Myths Podcast, uh, Twitter, at Northern Myths, at Northern Myths, and at North Myth Dan, and at North Myth Luke. Yeah, come uh, come chat with us. Uh, we've we've definitely been getting uh, uh, a lot more connected with people uh, on Twitter, especially, and and on Facebook. So definitely uh, definitely check us out there. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Uh, and again, yeah, any. Uh, questions comments concerns anything that we uh, said wrong or uh, any nuance that we didn't cover that uh, you figured out and would like to share with us we would absolutely love that because again we're we're learning here along we're just you know trying to talk it out so we can learn it and uh, absolutely any input that you have is uh, greatly welcome so we're looking forward to that and I think with that that's about it for the the normal uh, end of show stuff so I will leave you with uh, the same thing that we try and leave you with every time. And it's, uh, you know, paraphrasing Carl Jung is to find out what myth you're living. This has been the Northern Myths Podcast. Thank you very much.